98's A Simple Plan, Review and Thoughts film. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is fairly comparatively short. At least that's the idea. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. Now I start this video with a review most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so that you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the video, the review itself, please note, the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now. Wright County, a small, rural, snowy town in Minnesota. Three people, a guy, his friend, and his brother, find a crashed plane with a bag full of money. Millions of dollars. Two of them have no job, and the third is stuck in an unsatisfying job with relatively small wage, and has a kid on the way, so this is a life-changing find for all three of them. They agree to hide the find from anyone else and not spend the money until they're sure that it's safe to, but the pressure starts to strain their relationship and some unpleasant secrets, including ones from their past, start to rear their ugly head. Heads? Tails. Their greed corrupts and destroys. Now, if this is something you've never heard of, this is a crime drama thriller released in 1998 directed by Sam Raimi, no, really, and it's basically a spiritual successor to Hitchcock. And I would say, I think, you know, if Hitchcock had lived long enough to see this, I think he would have liked, you know, I, th I think he would have really felt that this was a, you know, a, a movie very much in his spirit. And I've seen some say that some of the characters are too sudden in their shift from being good people to doing awful things. When you watch this movie, and I hope you will, try to actually imagine how you yourself would react if you suddenly had access to that much money. Honestly, some of the reviews I read, you know, where people would say it feels like Sorry? Train of thought, jump the tracks. Some of the time when I was reading reviews, it almost feels, it, it almost felt like rather than criticizing an actual flaw in the movie, they're trying to assert that human beings are better than that, than what the movie shows. You're free to think that, but it's hardly a flaw of the movie that it's arguing that human beings could quickly become that cruel. It, like, if you, I, th I think you have to bring a, a good argument to, I didn't read all the reviews, so it's possible that some did, but I saw a number of reviews where they just said no, and that just feels like they're just trying, to, like, they, they, they're scared of losing faith in the good of mankind, and I can understand that, but this, this isn't your movie, you know, and I just, like, <laughs> If, if a movie is not is just not your kind of thing, that doesn't necessarily mean that reviewing it and being very, you know, very negative on it, you know, like, like hypothetically, if you come into this movie and you're expecting to see, you know, human beings being cruel to each other, and then you feel like, well, there's, there, there are criticisms to make of how they handled it, you know, that's that's fine, but just saying, I, d I don't like this, I've never thought was a particularly good, you know, good criticism of something. Now, the this was written by Scott B. Smith, who adapted his own novel, and I would say it, it does a good job of making the most of the concept. It gets a lot of different interesting situations out of this very, you know, like the, the, 
lesser writers would have, you know, I, I know some people think the movie is too long. I disagree. They're free to, they're, they're, yeah, they're free to think that, but I disagree. I would say that I, th I think a long movie has to justify why it's long. In a lot of cases, I'm, I'm not saying all of them, but if, if you're trying to make a crowd-pleasing movie and you want, well, I don't know if it's crowd-pleasing, if, if, if you're trying to make a movie that isn't trying to really, like, some movies, it's good for them to justify their length. And I would say this movie does. I can't think of a single scene that I would cut. And I suppose, hypothetically, I could see how you could trim some of the scenes, but I don't think it would be to the scene, the, the benefit of those scenes. Now, the, let's see, and I would say, that, you know, Scott B. Smith fully realized how to make the, the script work as well as it could. Now, some say the writing is contrived. I, I suppose an argument can be made. And some other also, some also say the characters make too many stupid decisions. I would argue that they seem like smart decisions at first. I, I don't think that there's any character, like if you want to say that they're frustrating, I will 100% grant that. They are frustrating characters, frustrating decisions. But I don't think there are any of the decisions made where it's like really obviously a bad decision. Like, got to keep in mind that two of the people making these decisions, you know, they they get drunk every day. They're not, you know, they're they're both. They're they're not the the they're not necessarily the smartest people around, you know, and yeah, and and the certainly the. There, there are some very smart characters in this movie. When they make decisions, like when you hear them saying, "This is what we'll do, and here's why." In my experience, like I've, you know, I've watched this movie a number of times. I've shown it to other people. Every, you know, each time, my, you know, my reaction and the reactions of the people I showed it to were like, "Yeah, I mean, what they're saying makes sense," you know. And, and it's, again, I'm sorry, but if you don't want conflict in a movie, then, I'm, I, I don't know, I, I suppose there's some movies out there, I, I don't think I know of any that don't have conflict. Like, I get it. Like, when I, when I was younger, I, the, it, it was a, I would read, let's see, I think it was, it was a book. And, and the more I read it, it just it just made me unhappy, and after a while, I was like, I mean, this is just it's just making me unhappy. I, I'm gonna stop reading. You know, some people maybe they don't really want to watch movies because it's just upsetting. You know, you imagine this stuff happening in real life, and it's like, no, I, that's horrible. If if that's what movies do to you, you know, maybe you just don't really. I I, I would recommend someone who feels that way to strongly consider. If it's just that they don't really want to watch movies, I, I feel like not like I know some people love musicals. I I'm not the kind of person who I there's nothing wrong with musicals as you know they they have you know every every medium has their strengths and their weaknesses, but it's just not my kind of thing. So I don't watch them. I, I at least extremely re rarely do I watch them. You know, anyway. And, and for sure, there isn't a single decision made in this where I don't buy that the character making that decision would make that decision. And the writing, it, you know, it does a good job of conveying time passing. You know, at the start of the movie, you know, Sarah is pregnant. And, you know, later in the movie, you see right after she's given birth, you know, and like the you know early on it's just about to be new year's eve and later you know the the yeah just you you get a sense of time passing without like i'm not saying it there's not there's nothing inherently wrong in just putting text on the screen that says 3 months later or march 30th or something but it can get kind of 
it, it can kind of pull you out of the, the illusion, you know? It, if you can convey time passing without having someone direct, or, or for a character to walk into a scene and say, you know, three months ago we had the, you know, I told you, you know, it just, if you can do it visually and subtly, it's, it's a very good idea to do that. And the movie handles twists, plot twists well, and I think some people feel that there are too many plot twists. I would say it's the right amount. I can understand why they think that, but I disagree. I, I would never say, you, you never lose track of what's going on. And, you know, a, a very, a, a potential flaw with plot twists is that you might end up with care, with, with characters as well, but the audience being confused about what's happening. And I would say, even on the first viewing, it's not difficult to keep up with all the twists. At times, the movie can move very fast. There can be very sudden developments. I would love to see Sam Raimi direct other Hitchcockian films. I'm not sure... It's been way too long since I watched The Gift for me to say if that one was Hitchcockian, but... Yeah, and this is also... You know, Bill Paxton really impresses here, and of course, so does Billy Bob Thornton. And... If... Excuse me. I, I would be very happy to see something else by Scott B. Smith. And the direction is very focused, and it is very, like, I think if it wasn't, I'm, I mean, it is literally, there is, there is literal evidence that Sam Raimi directed this. It's, it's, his name is in the credits. Whether you look them up, on Wikipedia or MB, whether you watch the credits in the movie, it says it right there. But it doesn't really feel like a Sam Raimi movie in, in a lot of ways. Like, when you compare it to the stuff he had directed before this, such as Evil Dead's 1, 2, and 3, Dark Man, and let's see. See, I don't... I don't remember The Quake and the Dead. I, I'm i not sure I was particularly fond of it, but I don't remember it. But yeah, this was not what people expected from Sam Raimi, and I'm really happy that he showed that he could do something incredibly different from the... I mean, the Evil Dead trilogy and Dark Man are essentially horror comic book movies you know, and uh, I'm aware that some people don't even realize there are, there is such a thing as horror comic books at all. Uh, you know, we, we tend to, when we think comic books, we think superheroes, but, you know, there, there are, and yeah, that is very much, like, if, you know, you could, I, I myself haven't read that many horror comics, but I believe that the... Tales from the Crypt, before it was a TV show and then two movies. Did they make a third one? Anyway, before that, it was comic books. And, yeah, you know, the, the like, if, yeah, hypothetical, if you're watching this movie and you haven't, and you don't really know what the Evil Dead movies are like, you know, if in, okay, I guess probably, then you probably haven't watched Demon Knight either, but that's, yeah, you know, that's, that's, fairly and and to be fair dark man is not as like the the gore is not as intense as the evil dead movies but yeah you know that's the kind of thing that he anyway and let's see so yeah so so after he made this he made the gift the spider-man trilogy and drag me to hell and yeah it is you know I, I'm not going to say, I don't know for sure if it was this movie, but he he did prove that he could do other stuff. He, he I, I think it would be a, a, 
it would be a shame if all Sam Raimi ever got to do were Evil Dead movies. I, I mean, the Evil Dead trilogy is an incredible trilogy. I'm not. I'm. I will. I'm not going to be saying anything negative about those movies. But I do think that he had other, you know, but by the time he made, you know, once you're all the way through Army of Darkness, the third of those movies, I don't know that he needed to do more with that. I'm, I'm aware that there are, like, video games and comics and such. I can imagine that there's more fun to be had in that world, but I'm not sure that a straight movie that's focused, like, like, if they did a crossover, I wouldn't have a problem with Sam Raimi returning, but if they just made another Evil Dead movie, you know, it, it was, it was how he helped prove his talent, and the, that first one, I'm not sure they even expected it to be a big deal, but it became a big deal. You know, like, they were working on it in the weekend, because they had real jobs in between. That's why it took so long to make actually, and they ultimately, some, some of the original actors couldn't keep working on it, but, you know, well, they're, I suppose, yeah, let me, I'll just abandon that sentence. Anyway, I'm really glad that he got to do other things, because he's proven that he can do, you know, Dra Drag Me to Hell was almost like another Evil Dead movie, and I mean, it's it's okay. It has it has some really good stuff, but I'm, you know, right now he's move he's he's, wait, right now or are they anyway? I'm not 100 percent certain of what how far into production they are, but he is he is has or will direct the second Doctor Strange movie, and I think he's an absolutely perfect fit. I I. I'm very torn on whether I wish that the original director, known for, among other things, Sinister, had stayed, or if I'm really, really happy that, like, I am I hope that, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Sinister director is going to keep getting work. It's not like, he's, you know, he's not Blacklist or something, so his career will go on, which I'm glad, because he also has a lot of really interesting stuff to, you know, interesting movies in him, but Sam Raimi directing a horror, you know, a, a comic book horror movie similar to how, you know, I, you know, Darkman is almost like, I, I don't think there were Darkman comics before the movie, I'm not sure, there might have been since, but that one straight up feels like a comic book movie, you know, and yeah, the, the, for the for the Evil Dead movies, it's more that there's a sense of the the comic. See, I feel like I'm sounding like I'm contradicting myself. What I mean is, with Doctor Strange two, it will be a horror. You know, it it has elements of horror, but it's also a superhero comic book adaptation, and that's the kind of thing he hasn't really done. A superhero comic book adaptation with horror like okay some of the spider-man movies have scenes that have horror or the horror scenes straight up but an entire movie that's horror we haven't seen an entire movie that's horror and comic book with superheroes we haven't seen from him yet now the let's see but but yeah you know sam raimi is especially known for Evil Dead trilogy and the OG Spider-Man trilogy and yeah but once again he absolutely understood how to best approach it and it's it's very Hitchcockian including some you know homages to the birds and there's also some Coen Brothers stuff going on and there's a lot of focus on building and maintaining tension. And honestly, other than Darkman, this is my favorite Sam Raimi movie. No, I'm not necessarily saying that these two are his best, but they are my two favorites. And 
and it actually like originally someone else was supposed to direct it it's not like um you know compared like evil dead he was always going to make you know he he was always excited about making a movie this he you know he he did get the job but he wasn't the first choice and sometimes when that happens the director can get kind of frustrated and kind of just phone it in and that really didn't happen here he gives it his all and honestly basically everyone who worked on this i would love to see them do more hitchcock and stuff well you know obviously bill paxton can't r.i.p and the opening does a good job of establishing the physical environment and the key relationships and it's a very powerful ending in my experience you know when i watch it again even re-watching it, knowing what's coming, and when I've shown it to other people, I've never lost interest, and no one I've shown it to has ever lost interest, but I've read that some people found that they lost interest along the way, I don't know, I guess, yeah, okay, some people will lose interest. Now, as an adaptation, I've read that the novel is a bit more brutal at points. I think they made the right choice to tone it down a little bit. I, I looked at the Wikipedia page for the book it has almost no details so I really can't make very many obviously I wouldn't be spoiling either of them here in the review yeah. I forgot about that sorry that's because I right before I recorded this video I recorded a thoughts video on the most recent episode of WandaVision which I do spoil yeah I Apologies if up to this point you've been like sitting there wondering is he gonna spoil because it he wrote he's spoiling or isn't he because he said he wasn't yeah anyway the the I wouldn't be spoiling movie or book in this in the in the review section either way even even if I could but I you know I, I years ago back when IMDb had message boards I read someone giving example, at least one example of something that happened in the book that they felt should have been in the movie. And yeah, you know, I could tell it's it was more brutal, certainly. I think it I think they made the right choice. And let's see what I think if you have never watched the movie The Birds, there are a few things in this that might feel slightly odd, but it is, you know, yeah. Let's see, and the cast also absolutely 100% understood. They, they got it. They, they knew how to make this work. And yeah, so the, the cast, Bill Paxton as Hank Mitchell, by and large, a very honest, decent man. In fact, at first, he wants to turn in the money, but the others convince him not to. He and his wife, Sarah, basically mastermind keeping the money hidden as, yeah, they're easily the two smartest of the four of them. Some people have said that Hank can be kind of smug. I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe some. I and Billy Bob Thornton as Jacob Mitchell. You can tell that Hank doesn't think very highly of Jacob and that it bothers Jacob. He wants them to keep the money. He's a good person, but he sometimes makes bad decisions. He's not really stupid as such. You know, he... He's maybe a little bit slow. And Bridget Fonda as Sarah Mitchell. Sweet and giving person, but she's also able to be very devious and manipulative. And her introduction has us focusing on her pregnancy, the fact that she's going to be a mother soon. And I, f I forget the exact word, but I saw someone in their review say, you know, we're basically like she looks. It's she, she's she's basically the personification 
of uh, a good mother. You know, she, there's a, there, you know, she looks healthy and happy. She looks like she's going to take good care of the baby. It's, it's weird that you can, but, but some, yeah, some people, you just, you look at them and you get the sense they're going to make a good parent. And Brent Briscoe plays Lou Chambers, Jacob's drinking buddy. They're basically each other's only real friend, and he very quickly gets very excited about the money. And Gary Cole is also very good. He, I'm not going to give away exactly what he plays in this, but yeah. And is it... I'm not 100% certain, so I'm going to try to pronounce this. Chelsea Ross as Sheriff Carl Jenkins. He is one of the biggest threats to them keeping the money. He takes his job as seriously as you would like someone in that position to, and as such would want to report the money if he found out about it. And yeah. And Becky Ann Baker as Nancy Chambers, Lou's wife who is frustrated with his immaturity, and she's basically taking care of him. And the acting is excellent. Honestly, I, I know that some people don't think that highly of Bill Paxton and Bridget Fonda. I think they do a great job. I've always, like, when I watch this, I, I never get the vibe off, like, you know, Bridget Fonda, she also played, what are they called, Be Beach Bunny in Jackie Brown, and like a, a kind of nosy reporter in Godfather Part 3, and when I watch one of these three movies, in the case of Godfather 3, not as many times as I've watched the, you know, the first two are amazing. The third one just it's it's such a step down. It's not even the worst movie ever made. It's just it's just such a step down from the first two, you know? Which is so weird because it's directed by the same was it also written by the same I do not know what happened there. Anyway. When I watch one of the movies that Bridget Fonda is in, I never really she never comes across to me as if she's playing one of the other characters that I've seen her play. You know, it's, yeah. And, let's see. You know, like, like in, yeah, she, she in, in this, she comes across as so intelligent and driven where, you know, and like, comparatively, you know, James Brown, she's kind of lazy and doesn't really want to, you know, she doesn't care that much about anything, I think, you know, and I mean, I guess, okay, when she's pushing this and and when she's pushing Godfather 3, sure, there's some, you, you could see how it's the same, but both characters have the same trait, so, you know, and the the actors have very good chemistry the the you really do get the sense that Hank and Sarah are a married couple that Hank and Jacob are brothers Hank and uh, sorry yeah Hank and Lou don't get that much along Jacob and Lou do really enjoy each other you know yeah and and yeah, convincing in their roles, well cast. I mean, if if there's any one performance, one actor, I think if you're if you really really enjoy watching Billy Bob Thornton in movies, I would say it's worth watching this entire movie. You know, really, unless you feel like it's the it's if it seems like the kind of thing that you would feel would isn't moving fast enough or you would feel that it's not you know maybe it's too too sad for you I 100% I would not if you think that the movie might make you sad 
and it's something you don't want, then don't watch it. It's one. It is very, very. Yeah, it is. It is. You are not gonna. And and again, that's where some of those negative reviews came from. They they thought that the, they didn't think the movie would make them so sad. They don't like being sad, so they write it. I'm not saying you can't criticize the movie from a, a standpoint of. I'm I'm just saying a lot of the reviews read like people just. They didn't think that the movie was going to make them sad, and now they're upset. You know. Anyway, yeah, Billy Bob Thornton alone is worth watching this movie for. He is. He gives such an incredible performance, and just like the way you see him changes over the course of the movie, in a way that really like this is the kind of movie where you should. Like, yeah, you, like, reaction videos, are those what they're called? I'm not very familiar with them, but, like, you should you should record, like, the reaction of someone watching the movie and, like, just take what, what do they say about Jacob right after they see him and what do they say about Jacob later, you know, once they've watched more of the movie. It's, yeah, excuse me. And the, the dialogue is good. It does a good job of giving everyone their own voice. Everybody feels authentic. Hypothetically, if you... If, if the... the just, just a short line from this, even if you just read it on paper and, you, and it didn't say which character it was, you would be able to tell who it is from the way they word things and the the reasoning and all this kind of stuff and Hank and Sarah do really great at reasoning while Lou and Jacob a lot of the time they say the first thing that comes to their mind which is not always so beneficial to the situation and yeah so the the writing of the dialogues is very true to life they sound like real people and the delivery is really, really, just, yeah, great. I've seen several of these actors, especially, perhaps especially Bill Paxson and Bill Gunthorn, play roles that are very different from their roles here, and they're convincing both here and elsewhere. You know, like Bill Paxton in this, and then like True Lies or Aliens. You know, huge difference. And Billy Bob Thornton in this and something like U-Turn, hugely different. And, yeah, it's it's high quality. Oh, sorry. I was a little bit too far. Oh, right there. There it is. Yeah. The, the characterization is quite good. And sometimes the characterization is by... You know, several of the characters, you see how they respond to unusual situations, such as realizing they might be able to keep millions of dollars, and it's very revealing how they react, what they want to spend the money on, for example, and how realistic they're being about when they can spend it, how soon they can spend it, and such. Now, I am not that familiar with cinematographer Ala Kivilo. I'm sorry, I hope that was correctly pronounced. I'm not trying to butcher the name. That is honestly the only, other than this, the only things they DP that I've seen are Hearts War in the Glass House. But the, the, they do a really great job here. You know, the, the, the camera work is one of the things that really helps make this so suspenseful and tense. It's honestly one of the most suspenseful and tense movies that I've ever seen, which is why it baffles me. There are a lot of people who don't think very highly of it. And the and the drama, the the way it's filmed also does well with the drama. There are a lot of medium shots and close-ups of faces as a character realizes something disturbing about maybe about themselves, maybe about their partners in crime. And just you, you see like the the there's a there's a what's that phrase? The 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 face is like a map or something like that. The human face is like a map, 
And yeah, like in this, you can really, I'm not saying it's unique to this movie, but the movie does a really great job and it clearly, it favors that. It favors letting the camera capture someone's face as they slowly realize just, you know, the, the, hmm. There are not a lot of examples I can give. So some of the some of the interactions between Lou and Hank, for example, when you know you see, like, I feel like Hank isn't really trying to. He just he doesn't have that much in common with Lou. You know, he's not like practically starting a fist fight with him, but he just. They don't have a lot to talk about, but Lou feels like Hank really looks down on him. And yeah, there are these scenes, like, very early in the movie, Lou s talks to, to Hank, and he says, you know, basically, you had to show off, you had to use one of those fancy words, because you went to college and we didn't. And, and Hank, I don't think he's really thinking about that it's gonna, like... You know, if, if he, like, we, the audience, have an easier time of him than realizing this is not exactly, you know, Lou is just going to get more, you know, angry or sad by this response. But Hank is basically like, have you really been thinking about that since, I mean, the last time we saw each other was, or, yeah, when, the, the time I used that word was like two months ago. Do you just sit around thinking about these things, you know, and he's... And, and that's the thing, because Lou's an alcoholic, and yeah, alcoholics do spend a lot of time thinking about things that upset them, you know. And as Hank is saying this, the camera makes sure to, to have Lou's face in frame as well. As you can see, like, he was... He, it didn't go the way he thought it would. He was, he was hoping... He was basic. I, I think basically he kind of thought that Hank would be like, I didn't realize, I didn't mean to upset you, Lou, I'm sorry. And when that isn't what happens, like Lou, you know, and, and when Hank points out, you, have you been thinking about this for months? You know, Lou is like, just the, the yeah, you can, you can tell. It's, it's like, there are, there are a lot of shots in this movie of faces where you can tell that, like, the, the what's it called? Ham hamster wheels are turning in there. They're just going going berserk. They're they're trying desperately to to process something or to come up with something, and just yeah, you know, it's it's the kind of thing a lot of movies would visualize. Would you know? In instead of having the focus on the face, they would be like maybe maybe pacing back and forth, or they would like try to draw a, a plan or something but instead you just you see the face and it's like the, there's a there's a great deal of trust placed on the actors that they can sell this and I, I I think this is one of the movies that can really help really really make people understand that you know Bill Paxton was very underestimated when, you know, in, in his life. A lot of people didn't think that he was that compelling of a leading man and that talented of an actor. But it's just, a lot of the time, it was the little subtle moments in his performance. And, yeah, it's, yeah, he was, he was immensely talented. Now... And other times, other aspects of the cinematography, sometimes the, the camera will, like, pan from a face or, you know, down to, down to a hand or something. Or it will cut from characters talking to show a reason why they have to be careful that their stories line up. And I am not going to be giving any examples of that in, in the review itself. And not, not until the thoughts section of the video. And the camera may subtly include in the shot a person or object affected by what's going on without drawing attention to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And yeah, so this was edited by 
Arthur Coburn, who also edited Monster, Spider-Man The Gift of the Mask, and Eric L. Beeson, who also edited The Alamo and Joyride. And, yeah, again, the, the editors absolutely understood how to make it work. And the, the editing works well to keep you deeply engaged. You know, when it needs to be very fast-paced, it is. But a lot of the time, it does tend to let a take play out. Let, kind of, let the camera rest on something. And honestly, I don't know. I feel like maybe if people didn't compare it, maybe it's because it's be, it was being compared to other movies from the late 90s. If you compare this to Hitchcock, it's like it's it's on the the fast end of the yeah you know and that's that's what it was supposed to be but you know I mean by 1998 Hitchcock had been dead for 18 years almost 20 years maybe people forgot what a Hitchcock movie was like but yeah you know and, and if you don't like Hitchcock movies that's also fine but it's just it doesn't make that much sense to criticize them for not being super fast paced but anyway. And, yeah, the, the movie has very few special effects, as it should be, but what little there is, is very convincing. It's, it's one of those things, you know, if, if a special effect, you know, not every special effect, but sometimes, if a special effect is good, you don't know that it's even there. And it's like, you know, when I, when I saw the end credits, I saw credits for people who had done effects, where I was like, there was that kind of effect. Oh yeah, I guess in the so it worked. And there are not very many stunts, but they're very effectively used. And the production design and set design is, is quite good. You get a good sense of the small town. You know, the the you Sarah works at the library, so we spend a little time there. We see just how you know the the there are some places that are very, that, that haven't been taken care of in a while. And we also see, you know, let's see, we see the, the home of both Hank and Lou. And let's see, we see the, the maternity ward of the hospital. We see the... Yeah, you know, and, and yeah, and then you have the, the you know, they, they find the, actually, I suppose that is a pretty good, they, where they find the plane is a little bit away from where people usually go, which is why the plane was hidden. And in fact, it was covered in snow. So you, you can tell, well, you know, it, it must have crashed a little while ago to be completely covered with snow like that. The, the um, actually considering how much it snows maybe not maybe it doesn't have to be that long anyway the the you can understand why the the plane didn't get yeah why why they didn't realize why why no one found it before they did they actually found it basically by accident the the thing was that a a fox ran try tried to Actually, sorry, yeah, a fox run, ran across the, the road as the, the three of them were driving. And they, you know, Hank is like, okay, it was a fox, let's, let's go, let's, you know, let's move on. But the others who are like, oh, man, that, that thing scared me, I want, I want revenge, you know. And so they, they chase it, and they end up a little far, you know, a little, little bit ways off from where the the road ends and you know that they, they walk they don't drive off the road but they they walk there and you know it's not near the farms and yeah you know nobody saw the plane and after you know they they're basically saying in a few months time the snow will melt then you know the the plane will be found by someone else and at that point we'll find out if we can keep the money or not because if someone finds the plane then they're like there's money missing you know if if they get caught with it they're criminals if they burn it you know no one's gonna know 
So, yeah, the. But but yeah, you know, you get a good sense of this small town, and it really is like. I don't think the it's not. It's not really a you don't get a, a bad impression of these people. It's just that, you know, they're they're regular people. They're they're fairly trusting. They, you know, they're they're kind to each other. Not not a lot of stuff happens in the town. You know, it's it's a small town. It's not. I've I've seen some say that the filmmakers must have a low opinion of. I I really don't see it that way. But yeah, you know, they're 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 regular people, and you you know you can tell that this is like they would. These people would. It it really would completely change their lives if they are able to keep and spend this money. You know the the. It it's it could really improve their lives greatly. And let's see. yeah, and the movie has some scenes of significant tension, and it's very well handled. And there is a little bit of a gory tribute to the birds, but you know, outside of that. Honestly, even within that, it, this is incredibly different from the, you know, the Evil Dead trilogy. And I'm not going to give away whether or not this movie has a villain. But, you know, Hank, Hank is our protagonist and he is easy to sympathize with. You know, he's introduced as being a nice person who likes his co-workers, he likes the people around him. And, let's see. you know, and in, in the long term, over the course of the movie, you know, maybe he and the other two start doing unethical things in order to keep the money. Now, the... Yeah, and the, the scenes are easy to follow, and they're meant to, and I think that was the right decision. Some of the situations, there are a lot of different elements to keep track of, and the movie does a great job of establishing them properly and making it easy through editing to keep track of. And, let's see... Yeah, and this the the score is by Danny Elfman. And yeah, you know, again, known for Spider-Man trilogy. And let's see, he's done Hulk, Mars Attacks, and a number of other um Tim Burton, so very different from what this movie called for. And the, the score of this movie is quite good. The, the, the tension and drama of scenes are done very nicely. The, the score aids them well. Now, as far as like comedy and humor, there are a few jokes like making fun of people not being the smartest and making fun of hypocrisy and such. It's not a humorless movie, but there's not a lot of jokes either. A lot of the humor is kind of dry. Not not like laugh out loud, knee slapping hilarity, but it's like, hmm, oh yeah, that's kind of funny. It actually, it, it physically changes your voice to sound exactly like that. Let me find that joke for you. And let's see. Right, and so, yeah, so I already mentioned the this falls into the crime drama for the genres and the subgenre, and, sorry, and now I will add to it that it fits into the subgenre of neo-noir, and it does a, a good job at all of those. Now, let's see. So, as far as... Yeah, so the, the movies, let's see, 
Yeah, so, so Fargo is in some ways similar to this. And I can completely understand those who say that Fargo is even better than this. Personally, I prefer this to Fargo, but Fargo is great. One thing, I wouldn't say that the plot of this is all that similar to the plot of Fargo. Atmosphere, setting, the, you know, some, some of, like, the, okay, you know, both are about the, you know, potentially a lot of money ending up in the hands of some people, and they have to try to keep it hidden. But overall plot are not that similar. And I'm I'm not going to bring the movie Fargo up a lot in this video. It's been years since I last watched Fargo, the Coen Brothers movies. Not to be confused with Argo, the Ben Affleck movie, or Arg, which you know is what you might say if you stub your toe. Or R, which is what pirates used to say, or a, uh, which is a letter. And so, yeah, the, the core concept of several people finding a lot of money together and start tearing them apart, forcing them to do unethical things. I'm pretty sure there are other movies with... Okay, yeah, if you, if you get it that vague, I guess Ar Fargo, not Argo is fairly similar to, anyway but yeah it's it's probably there are probably a number of other movies but i would say that this was definitely worth making it's it's not just one of those things of like well why didn't you know comparatively same year came out the the psycho remake and i haven't watched it so i'm not i'm not saying that this is for sure true because maybe i'm wrong maybe what i've been told about it is lies like, you know, apparently, like, I, I recently watched the, the video where Adam from Your Movie Socks, Your Movie Sucks, sorry, talks about how people have been lied to about the movie Kimba being all that similar to Lion King, or the, yeah, the the various Kimba, the, the series and movie, er, anyway. I'm not saying I know for sure, but what I've heard about the cycle we make is that it's essentially shot for shot but it's in color and they added a few things that make literal things that in the original were hinted at. And I don't think that's, I, I don't think there's really any reason to make a movie like that. I, I can understand like completely changing, like I've seen movies that, you know, once you've watched the entire one, I was like, that's kind of like if Psycho was slightly, uh, okay, yeah, that's, that's interesting. But just making a shot for shot remake, you know, I, I don't know why you just, why wouldn't you just put Psycho back in movie theaters? Like, I'd, I'd prefer if you didn't color, you know, to put, add colors to it. The, the, you know, the, the, I, I don't sort of think that it's all that compelling, you know, I, I get it. Some people don't like watching black and white. And I mean, if you, if I'm going to watch something in black and white, I really want it to be a director I already know is incredibly talented, you know. Now, there's some very strong violence and some some gore, and there is a moderate amount of violence and gore, and let's see. There's a lot of tension and suspense building up to the violence, and violence really carries weight in this film. And it's not fun, it's not cool, you don't watch action, it's just violence in this, and you're like, yeah, you know, awesome, you know, and I really appreciate that. And that is, again, something that the master of suspense would have appreciated about this movie. And it's huge, like, if you actually try to watch one of the Evil Dead movies, and then this... In, in like, you know, not, not, with not much time passing between watching one and watching the other. It is like they are worlds apart. It really shows just how much range Sam Raimi has as a director. Now, there's, there's very little sexual material. 
and I think it's it's right that they're actually one of the first thing you know yeah so yeah I already mentioned almost right away you see the you see Sarah with her big pregnant belly and I don't know I guess you can kind of also see her breast she's like in a robe I saw someone say oh you know a bit of nudity in this I'm like it's not sexual though like she's like it's to show that she's like the image of motherhood basically you know I don't know some people just the moment that there's just a tiny bit of, of skin it's just yeah I don't know I guess you do see her nipples I didn't really notice yeah are they covered by the robe it's just I, I don't understand why so, you earthers have hang-ups now the tone can be fairly bleak and yeah I'm, I'm just gonna th this is the this is the review what's it called the entire review quote from the righty reviewer Glenn Lavelle the key differences are in differences are in emphasis and tone Fargo is deadpan noir a simple plan with Bill Paxton, Billy Bob Thornton, as Mutt and Jeff siblings is a more robust Midwestern Gothic that owes as much to Poe as Chandler. Beautifully put. And yeah, so the pacing, it keeps moving at a good pace. Some say it's slow. I think it makes more sense to call it a slow burn. It's never boring. It tends to rest on very tense scenes instead of rushing into the next scene. I don't know. It's just some people don't like tense scenes that they they want there to be more action. I mean, I I know that this is it's you know compared to some of Sam Raimi's other movies, you know it's it's it doesn't move as fast as the the Spider-Man movies or Evil Dead trilogy. But anyway, and it's, yeah, and so this it's an hour and fifty six minutes. And I would say it's well worth the investment of time. If when you watch, if by the time you've watched half an hour, if you're still not engaged, then you, I think you might as well shut the movie off. I don't think you're going to, yeah. I, I don't think it's really going to end up hugely changing. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I'm just going to yeah so so like I said this is very Hitchcockian a lot of his movies center on an individual or a small group of people who are trying to hide a secret that could really change their lives for the worse if they're found out so yeah this is very much in Hitchcock's spirit I, I don't know if if Scott B. Smith was thinking Hitchcock when he wrote a book and or script, but certainly Sam Raimi was thinking Hitchcock when he was directing it. And yeah, you know, a movie like Family Plot by Hitchcock is also about a small group of people trying to avoid being found out for the money they've upturn, obta <laughs> obtained without earning it. And yeah, and so the yeah, so so noir movies that I would say have some you know you could you could somewhat compare to this are Double Indemnity and The Postman Always Rains Twice. You know, also movies about someone possibly getting rich very suddenly in a way that could change their lives. And yeah, so I would say, you know, the movie is not quite unique. It feels a lot like Hitchcock. Actually, I do have to wonder if Hitchcock would feel it was too close. You know, he, he was not happy that Brian De Palma was making movies very similar to Hitchcock's. So I suppose there's a chance that he would have felt this was too close to a Hitchcock movie. I, I think there's enough difference between this and the Hitchcock movies. I, I've watched at least one of the Hitchcock, the Parental Palmer movies that Hitchcock felt were, you know, 
plagiarism, and I can understand why. I, th I think Brenda Palma meant it as homage, but I can understand why it was read as plagiarism. And some people might be offended by the depiction of Southerners, but I really don't think... I mean, the people we most empathize with are, you know, themselves Southerners. The, yeah. And I would say the best element of the movie is seeing the gradual process of the relationships fall apart due to the money. And, I mean, the, you know, I, I try to be brutally honest with in these reviews and talk about the worst aspect. The movie is arguably a tad preachy, you know. It says the money is the root of all evil. I see the root of, I see money is the root of all people. We all follow paper trails, paper trails. Everybody gotta pay their bills, pay their bills. Seriously, though, I feel like people who say that money is the rule of evil are either certain they'll never have very much money, you know, sour grapes, or they're certain that they'll never themselves have too little money. It's kind of easy to not be obsessed with the idea of having a lot of money if you yourself have so much money that you don't need to get more. Meanwhile, there are some rich people that are still obsessed with getting even more money. Before I watched this, I was worried that Sam Raimi would include a lot of gore. I love it in the Evil Dead trilogy. I eat that stuff up, but it would not fit this story. The, the story and this tone at all. And I was maybe also a little bit worried that there'd be like a goofy comic book tone also found in those movies and Dark Man. And he didn't. And once again, you know, Dark Man is one of my all-time favorite movies. And I'm, I'm not saying, you know, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm not criticizing those movies. I'm just saying that, that this is different from those. And, yeah, what I was most looking forward to about the movie was the Hitchcockian approach, and the movie managed to exceed my expectations. There are not very many people who can follow Hitchcock, and it is not, I don't say lightly, but Sam Raimi with this and Brian De Palma with some of his, yeah, I mean, once you've watched a few Brian De Palma movies that are about suspense and tension, you can kind of tell, okay, yeah, he would he would do a really good job as a, as a Hitchcock. Yeah. Now, I would say that, yeah, of, of, as far as people, you know, if, if you really enjoy this movie, I would say Bill Paxton, Billy Bob Thornton, and Sam Raimi are worth seeking out more work of. And, yeah, so recently I've tried to you know, say at the end of one of these reviews whether the movie is fun to watch or not, whether it's actually good or not. And this is both, well, I guess, fun. It's engaging to watch. And it's also a really well-made movie that holds up to scrutiny. And I recommend this to any fan of Hitchcock, the cast, Sam Raimi. As long, you know, Sam Raimi as a talented director, not Sam Raimi, the Evil Dead slash Spider-Man guy. And, yeah, I rate this eight life-changing bags of money found out of ten. And with that, we get into the spoiler section. And it starts with disclaimers so yeah thoughts section from here on out if you don't care about these disclaimers i'll try to keep them short and relevant but your mileage may vary you can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box i often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of it is very standard information i'm not going to keep speaking as fast as i sometimes do during this section once i get into the video itself with that said please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. And yeah, so this contains spoilers. Unmarked spoilers throughout the rest of this movie. If I spoil anything other than this movie, I will hold up an index finger. Verbally warn, hold up an index finger, and 
I won't lower my index finger until I'm done spoiling, so you can mute and skip ahead. Since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I'll touch my face. I will assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, let's see. So, content warning and or trigger warning. I am going to be discussing potentially triggering content of this movie, including gun violence, accidentally shooting a close friend or the like, death of loved ones, including by suicide. Now, I don't have a problem with violence and gore in general, but things from my favorite horror movies and movies in general. I also love Cronenberg's Fly Video Drum, etc. I don't have a problem with film sexuality and nudity, disturbing and upsetting material in general. Monster is one of my favorite movies. I might swear a little in this video, but probably not very much. I got this movie on sale, so anything they might say in this is not out of bitterness. I just do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. Uh, it's not that I'm upset how it compares to what is adapting other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this are for a criticism based on budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here, I loved every line they put in the IMDb memorable quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And that is pretty much it. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of this MSC 3AK riff tracks and other jokes, especially, uh, yeah. Time codes for those sections are in the description box. The first section is thoughts that I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. The, and the final section is, let's see, yeah, I get into stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. And that, excuse me. Now, sometimes for these videos, I try to get into whether the movie appears to have empathy for the least likable characters and whether I think they made the right choice on that. I think it pretty much has empathy for everyone. I mean, it doesn't have much empathy for the kidnappers, but, you know, that is understandable. But you know, like, I think a lot of people watching the movie think very little of Lou and Jacob. Especially Lou. You know, Jacob gets a couple of monologues that, yeah. Although some people have said that the monologues made him sound pathetic. So, yeah, you can't account for... Limited empathy. I'll go with that. But, I yeah, I would say the movie does have empathy for Lou and Jacob. I mean, they... Jacob just wants the life that he was promised when he was younger, you know? He was supposed to inherit the farm. He was the oldest son. He was... Yeah. And and now that... I mean, the money, he could, he could buy the farm back. That would ah, oh, that would be amazing. Just it would it would be like they never, they never had to sell it in the first place, you know. And Lou, I mean, I know that a lot of people look at gambling and say, you know, only awful people gamble. But I mean, basically, he he thought that he would be able to hugely change his life, and yeah, he he fell for the. You know, loud noise, glaring neon promise of gambling. And he gambled away money that he couldn't afford to lose. And, you know, right, right before, you know, one of the last lines he has before he dies, before Jacob has to shoot him, is, they're going to take my truck. 
you know, it's, I mean, he really, he's going to lose basically everything if he can't get the money soon. So, I don't, I, I find that, I, I have a lot of empathy for him. And I think that is the idea. And I think that is right. It, I, with this kind of movie, it's important that, I mean, I suppose you could say when, when Jacob, sorry, when Hank kills, you know what, I'm just going to call him the other kidnapper posing as an FBI agent that yeah so, something like that I think we're that's supposed to be you know a tiny bit of a yeah you get him moment but other than that when someone dies in this it's horrifying you know and yeah that is something that Hitchcock would really approve of the the yeah you know when 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 Lou when, when they have to shoot Lou, or, yeah, Jacob has to shoot Lou, and Hank has to shoot Nancy, you know, there's no, I mean, yeah, the, <clears throat> a, a lot of times we're kind of laughing at Lou, you know, he's, it's just the, the, you know, he's, he's kind of hard to take seriously a lot of the time, but, at the end of the day, he's, he's a human being with fears and desires, and yeah, he just he couldn't quite handle possibly having that much money. You know, he it made him and and you know, there's that one scene where he shows up and he's knocking on the door to to Hank late at night, and it's like Hank wakes up from the noise and then goes down and checks. Lou doesn't even seem tired. He's probably been up a lot of the night because he doesn't have a job to go to. So he just sits up at night drinking, thinking about all that he's going to spend the money on. You know, I mean, it must feel incredibly painful to not be able to go out and spend the money. Now, let's see. That was right. I I may have watched yes, I definitely watched this by the year two thousand nine. I'm not certain if that was when I first watched it, but you know, I wrote a review of it in two thousand nine, so I know that yeah, but it's possible it was you know earlier, and I just didn't do the review yet. And since the first viewing, I've watched it three or four times in addition to now watching it today, you know, and then after it was done, doing a one-hour video on WandaVision and then hitting record on this video. My making jokes in this should not be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad and me wanting to make light of this subject of or that, that kind of thing, I simply find it very difficult not to MST3K and overanalyze everything I watch and play. And that brings us to the next section. Excuse me. And I am buying time so that the time code will align easier and right. Notes taken while watching. The very first thing we hear is Hank narrating about what makes a man happy. And the very ending is him narrating about how, you know, all that he's lost now. And we see Hank interacting with some of his colleagues, his boss, neighbors, and it's clear that He's a nice, sweet, well-liked man. And leading up to them finding the plane, Lou is basically constantly trying to provoke Hank. You know, like when when <clears throat> excuse me. When they're in the car, Lou is telling this this joke to to Jacob. 
and like Hank doesn't make it a thing that he didn't you know he he didn't find the joke funny but Lou has to make it a thing you know he's like oh, I like that well he didn't you know and it's the like and and honestly I mean at the at the start the the what's it called I I really I really appreciate that we do get to briefly see Hank and Sarah together, Hank with Jacob, Hank with Lou, before they find the money. So we realize how steep of a drop it is once they once they realize that they might end up with, I mean, it's a million and a half per per. I mean, okay, so obviously both Lou and and Hank will probably share it with their wife, but that's still like that's a, that's an insane amount of money. That is that is. You don't have to worry about the money for the rest of your life money. You know, unless you go out and just spend like crazy, of course. But, like, if you have that much money, you know, yeah. So, so the, um, let's see, that's, yeah, at the, at the start of the movie, Hank actually wasn't expecting um, Lou to be there. You know, it. The idea is for Hank and Jacob to go put fresh flowers on their at their father's grave, and we we get this brief little indication, you know, when when uh, what's it called uh, when they get there. Yeah, and sorry, other provocation is uh, other antagonizing by Lou of of Hank is when he brings up the insinuation and stuff hint and almost throwing a snowball at him and all this stuff anyway yeah you know the as far as i understand it's basically the it's the same day new year which can make it confusing for people like charlie harper that the brother's father died and so they're going to put flowers on the you know and and hank is like what someone Somebody else was already here, and and Jacob said, "Oh yeah, no, I I came here, you know." And and Hank is like, well, "Why?" And and Jacob, you know, and and it's the first time we really see. But sometimes Jacob does kind of get fed up with Hank, kind of trying to control, you know, his circumstances, and he's like, "What? We can only come here the one time of year." You know, I, I think the idea is supposed to be that Hank basically feels like, well, you should you should have called me. You know, I I would have come with you, but Jacob knows some things about their father that Hank doesn't, and there's a lot of pain there, where it seems like Jacob can't quite let go where Hank basically has, and you know, you'll you'll note that Jacob brings up their father more than more than Hank and the the way also the way they bring him up you know Jacob brings up that their father gave a lot so that Hank could have a could get an education where when Hank brings him up it's sometimes as like you know don't you think our father would have wanted you and I to stand together against Lou you know he's he's using it to manipulate him basically. Excuse me. Now, let's see, and that's also that. You know, it's it's one of the first. It's one of the first things we we find out about Lou, and it really does show, he's not a very serious person. He doesn't really handle serious particularly well. He's actually standing there, like writing his name in the snow, when they're, you know, putting fresh flowers on their father's grave. It's, it's, yeah. And let's see, there was one other thing I wanted to. And and he also he sort of moons. He doesn't pull his pants down, but he, you know. Keeping his pants on, he presses his butt against the window of the the car at one point. 
it's a really great reveal on the pilot when the you know Hank gets into the plane and you know you just at first you just briefly you just, at first you just see his head from behind and then it looks like it's it's moving slightly so Hank and we briefly think he might still be alive and then you know the camera cuts and we realize it's moving because these like ravens or whatever they're called are like you know pecking at his eyes and yeah very the birds very i i the, i watched i rewatched the birds just a few months ago last time i watched this was maybe a year ago and at that point it had been years since i watched last the birds so i was like oh, <laughs> There's a there's a birds thing going on there, but now I watched the birds much more recently. I was like, oh wow, that is very the birds right there. I really appreciate that Hank takes some convincing before he agrees that they keep the money. And you know, Lou really tries to convince him, arguing they can keep it without problem, and getting Hank to you know, getting Hank to take some of the one one of the bundles in his hands. Suddenly, it's a lot less abstract. You know, that's that's also the same way Hank convinces his wife. Once it's no longer abstract, I'm I'm not I'm not claiming that I'm better than if I thought that I could get millions of. Yeah, I think I probably would do some things that otherwise I would never even dream of. You know, I hope it never happens. But yeah, I I mean, I I don't know if I'm gonna make it a big thing in this video. I think that basically everyone should be able to get, you know, to, to, I don't think, I think that the governments that can afford it, which is a lot of the Western governments, should do what they can to make sure that regular people don't really have big fears about how they're going to be able to afford things they need, you know, I, like if you, hypothetical, if you, if you want to spend a lot of money on something that you don't really need, you know, if, if the, if you, I, yeah, I don't know how much I'm going to make it a thing. Not everybody likes when I get political in these videos. Yeah, I think that's as much as I'm going to say. And about that, at least right now. They count the money, and then they see the sheriff driving up. Sirens. I used to welcome the sound. And it's, it's a good, it's, it's a nice little thing of like, at first, it's like early morning. You know, you see Hank and Sarah get up in the morning. And then Hank goes down to get in the car. You know, Sarah teases him up. You're you're in for a good time. Lou is with Jacob in the car, you know. And then they you know, they find the plane very soon after they, they start driving. And then they actually spend the entire rest of the day and night, you know, going into the night of counting the money. And I'm not gonna lie, I think I would personally have made sure to like just pack the money away and then leave it with Hank, and then maybe Hank can count it in his house. But, like, if... Yeah. Anyway. But I, I'm i not saying it's an unrealistic bad decision. It's a bad decision. But they want to know how much money they have. You know, of course they want to. Yeah. They cover the money with the gym bag, and we see Maryville, the dog, sniffing at, like... And it's, and it's this thing, because, like, the dog doesn't understand that the sheriff can't see the money, you know, and it's like, it's curious. There's, there's something there that it, it wants to know. And, and we're like, no, don't, you know, cause it, like, if it, if it uses, it's, if, if, sorry, if Maribel, if she uses her nose to push the, the bag a little too far, push some of, push one of the bundles of money a little too far, like, okay, someone drives up and you have like a, a gym bag in the back of your truck, whatever. You know, there's a lot of root. There's many different reasons why you might have a gym bag on the back of your truck. 
But if there's a thick bundle of money in that, if there's at least one of those in that gym bag, you might be a little curious as if, if you know, if there's more than, like, one of those bundles is probably more money than Hank and Sarah have, have like, saved up for a rainy day, you know. And, yeah, and when they're driving Lou home, now that Hank is hiding all the money for them, Lou isn't provoking him anymore. Interesting, that. And, and you know, the, the, they argue because Hank is like, it wasn't a good idea to tell him about the plane. And, you know, there, it's tense for a little bit, and then Lou repeats the, the uh, what's it called? The, the punchline of the joke he told earlier. Again, you know, he can't really, the, the serious stuff he's not good with. And let's see, what was another thing that I wanted to say? Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, obviously it was a bad idea to tell Carl about the, the plane. But you can kind of understand how, you know, they... They were thinking that if we pretend like we heard, we may have heard the plane, then no one's going to suspect us of having found it and taken something from it. Because then why would we? It's like a reverse psychology? Eh, I'm not sure. It's double bluff. It's, it has a name. Triple Yahtzee, that's what it's called. And, yeah, you can kind of understand why they would think that. But at the same time, we and Hank realize it's a really bad idea. And honestly, if Carl hadn't heard them say that, then I'm not sure he contacts the Mitchell brothers at the end of the movie when an FBI agent comes in talking about a missing plane. And Hank tells Lou that they have to keep the secret of the money, and it looks like Lou immediately tells Nancy about the, the money. You know, like when, when he walks up and she's like, you said you were going to, you know, what was it, shovel the path, wait, something like that. And, you know, and, and he's like, you yeah, know, baby... This time, I've got a great, I, I have a, you know, I have a good excuse for it or something like that. And immediately we're like, he's going to tell me, you know, and what is Hank going to do? Like, step out of the car and be like, don't finish that sentence. Like, you know, what's, he, he can't stop Lou from saying it, obviously. And, yeah, Lou and Hank both come home to their wives long after they were supposed to. But where Nancy is angry with Lou... Sarah takes it much better. I mean, you. she's like, I, I was a little worried, you know, but she's not like, where have you been? You know, it w honestly would be completely understandable, but, you know, it's, I, yeah, she, she takes it very well. You, you can tell already Lou and Nancy are not that happy together, and, you know, Hank and Sarah are very happy together. And... I will talk about the scene where Hank gradually convinces Sarah about the money in the next section. Excuse me. And Hank goes back in the plane, puts the money back, and we get a little more creepy and gross stuff with the pilot. I have to wonder if that was in the script or it was just Sam Raimi not being completely capable of leaving behind his gory past movies. Kind of like the car crash in Doctor Strange, you know, it's like, well, gee, I wonder what kind of movies this guy used to direct. And let's see. that's that's not a spoiler, that's literally one of the first things that happens in that movie. And 
Jacob hits Dwight Stevenson in a state of panic. And like when when Jacob, you know, afterwards he was just like, well, I had to stop him from the plane because the money, you know, and and uh, yeah. Okay, so briefly, I'm gonna. Yeah, I will briefly spoil. What's it called? Mice of mice and men, I think. Of mice and men, spoiler start. It's a lot like when he, uh, the Lenny, I want to say, accidentally, you know, kills the and and afterwards can't understand why is you know yeah, no more spoilers. No more spoilers for of mice and men. Jacob can't really understand that Dwight is dead. You know, he's like, there has to be something we can do, like CPR or something. I really appreciate the weight given to that first murder, because it really is, you know. And actually, come to think of it, between Dwight Stevenson dying, the next person killed is actually Lou. And it's a pretty decent amount of screen time between them, isn't it? Like... Maybe thirty or thirty minutes, maybe. I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure. Maybe more. Could could be less, but I feel like there's a, a while there without. And it's legitimately a surprise and disturbing when we realize Dwight did survive Jacob hitting him, and very disturbing looking at Hank as he gradually realizes and decides on killing Dwight. You know, this is again. Like, there are so many movies that would not, but, you know, we, we see Hank's face, you know, D Dwight wakes up and he's like, your brother hit me, call 911, you know, and we see Hank, and, and gradually he goes, you know, at, at first he's, like, surprised and, like, a little, you know, upset, and, you know, gradually we see him realize, you know, now that Jacob has hit him, there's no way that they, if... Hank doesn't kill. Obviously, I'm not making excuses for him. Obviously, you should never kill someone. The only, it is only ever reasonable to use violence if it is in service of preventing greater violence. But hypothetically, let's say that Hank, yeah, you know, Jacob would go to prison. You know, there's, I mean, what what more do you need? Like, if if Dwight shows up and you know he's got like a well, okay, I guess according to the movie, he doesn't have a, uh, an obvious wound from being hit in the head, because otherwise the coroner would realize, you know, I'm not going to make excuses for that. I don't, I don't know if Scott B. Smith didn't really think about that aspect, or he doesn't know that much about forensics. There's no way that these deaths would not be, yeah, 100%. Maybe I should have said that earlier in this video, but I don't, I, I think pretty much every single death in the movie, in real life, they they would have realized what, what actually happened. Or they would have realized that there were problems with the story that Hank gives. But, yeah, so we have the, yeah, Dwight, you know, if Dwight shows up at the, at the you know, if, if Dwight talks to a cop and he's like, look, he hit me right here, you know, we know, like, there's... You know, he hit him. He hit him hard enough that Dwight, like, basically went unconscious. You know, and I mean, Dwight's own witness. Uh, you know, yeah, witness statement. That's going to be enough to to put Jacob away. And you know, if you want to get cynical about it, it, that would mean that they, you know, the money might not be be safe anymore. But even without that, just, like, Hank would be devastated for Jacob to go to prison. Like, he is at the end of the movie when Jacob, you know, when he has to shoot Jacob. I appreciate that the movie does spend several seconds with Dwight dying. It doesn't go by quickly. We have to see his face afterwards, the fear on his face as he realized that he was about to die. I mean, compared to this with one of the gory kills in Sam Raimi's Evil Dead trilogy. Completely different. Once again, I love those movies, but I really appreciate seeing Sam Raimi making a movie that's this different from those, instead of letting his entire career be completely defined by those three movies. You know, I, I mean, I've seen... 
I love both Crank movies, but having watched both Crank movies, Gamer, and the, what was it called? Uh, Ghost Rider. Okay, maybe to a lesser extent Ghost Rider, but when you watch Gamer, you kind of realize they're kind of one-trick ponies, aren't they? Because the, there's a lot about the movie Gamer that's similar to Crank, but doesn't really make sense for it to be in Gamer. You know, like Crank, it makes perfect sense. It makes sense why it's filmed and filmed, edited, acted, written, directed, all of it. Each little element works with all the other ones. You know, if you want to say that those are two bad movies, I completely understand where you're coming from. But I think it's silly to say that the way it's that the way they're filmed, for example, doesn't really make sense for the way for for the movies themselves. I would say they definitely do. But when you come to gamer, some of it is just really doesn't fit at all. And I'm just really glad that Sam Raimi has been able to prove that he's not a one trick pony. And Jacob wants to tell the police, confess, but Hank tells him that he finished off Dwight because Jacob didn't fully kill him. And when Hank tries to convince Jacob not to confess, at first Jacob gets very angry. And you get the sense that Hank has been telling Jacob what to do for years. And Jacob usually just pretends that he doesn't mind, but this time it's too far. And Sarah is focused enough to think about whether they left footprints or blood. Does it scare you? At first, Sarah doesn't even realize that Hank is talking about what he did rather than on Jacob knowing. She really, she almost does become like a different person. The, the, I mean, basically... I, I feel like it's almost like some kind of instinct that goes in and like like a survival instinct. Yeah, basically. A survival instinct that kicks in for the various ones. And yeah, you know, when it comes to Blue and Jacob, their survival instincts are just not that good. You know, they, they make mistakes. And the yeah, the survival instincts of both Hank and Sarah yeah, you know, it it is really they're they're very it it it's almost like uh, Actually, yeah, I can say yeah, okay, so spoilers for a history of evil. History of violence, sorry. Spoilers for a history of violence. I was like that's not right. Okay. This both a simple plan and a history of violence, there are some scenes where you get the sense that sometimes to survive, people maybe do things that aren't ethical and that aren't illegal. You know, modern society supposes that we don't need to do those things anymore, but a simple plan and a history of violence, there are some scenes where it's like, I mean, they did it to survive. You know, they're not, it's not cruelty, it's survival. And yeah, no more spoilers for history of violence or history of evil, in case that is a thing that exists. The, but yeah, I really appreciate the, the weight given to this first kill. Like in, in the, in the, it's like a really long shot, the, the camera is very far away from Jacob and Dwight at first, and you just see Jacob bring out and smacking, you know, and it's like, no, it's, it's, it's like, it's so far away, we can't rush him to stop it, you know, and then, you know, Hank is driving off, so, so he's gonna fake the Dwight accidentally ran over, and then suddenly Dwight come, you know, wakes up, and, and Hank falls off the, the, what's it called, snow scooter thingy, you know, and and Hank's face as he makes the decision, Hank confessing to Jacob, and then you know asking Sarah, you know, and and she never actually says yes. You know, he's like, "Do you think you would have done the same thing if you were in my shoes?" 
and then they they hug but she doesn't actually say I, I would have she just says oh honey you know so there is that it's just yeah it's really it's given a good deal of weight and this isn't even a person we knew you know later on Lou is gonna end up dead and and Carl and Jacob and I mean we we also didn't really know Nancy but yeah you know it, it really is the the kind of thing you know some people will kill to be millionaires I really appreciate the scene with Mr. Schmidt arguing with Hank over how much he was billed. Not only because it's kind of neat to see father and son. No, seriously, that's Bill Paxton's father. I forget his... John Paxton, maybe? If, if you feel like you've seen his face, he also plays the the butler in the... In Spider-Man 2 and 3. I forget if we actually do see him in the first one. But he's supposed to have been around in the first one, at least. But, yeah. You know, so if you, you know, yeah. He's he's the one talking to Harry Osborn in Spider-Man 2 and 3. Anyway. It's, yeah, it's kind of neat to see Father and Son acting in the same movie and not playing relatives or anything. But also because it's a very believable argument to be having. At first, the guy can't believe how there could be five... Mondays, because there obviously wasn't five weeks in a single month, but it's true, there are some months where there are five Mondays, you know, the, the, yeah, and, and that's, and he's like, I come in here, you know, this and that, so and so often, every time, twice, you know, once per week, how could I possibly be billed five times for more for one month? Explain that to me, Inc. And you know, and I like how you know, if, you know, he has to answer the phone. Go check the calendar on the you know if, if you don't believe me, and he's like on the phone. Are, are we are we okay, Mr. Schmidt? And and he doesn't say anything. He just walks out, and the door closes behind. Him. That's kind of funny because he's like. He's, he's gotten all worked up at like, you're trying to cheat me out of money, and I am not going to stand for it. And and then he's like, oh, well, it's a mistake. Well, let's just walk out the, yeah. And it's it's a kind of fun little, you know, again, yeah, kind of kind of dry humor. It's, it's not hilarious. And I don't know, maybe some people feel like it makes Southerners look stupid. I, I feel like that's a, it's a pretty normal mistake to make now let's see. and Jacob tries to convince Hank you know to buy the farm and then kick the bucket and then anyway and he tells him that the reason their father went broke okay I'm sorry just briefly I voice type these notes in Google Drive it would you you know Google Docs, and it's great. It it gets almost it, it gets a huge chunk of what I say absolutely right. It's maybe like ninety percent of it is right, but occasionally the ten percent can be kind of funny. So I I tried to voice type the reason their father went broke. It wrote the reason their father went bro. I mean I guess if your father wasn't usually a bro. And then suddenly he started acting like a bro. Might be a cause for conversation. Fair enough. I, I, yeah. Anyway, the reason their father went broke was because the money went to Hank's education. And you get the sense that Jacob has always been overlooked by the rest of the family. <clears throat> and Sarah tells Hank that the money was a ransom and she sees it as a positive, but he sees it as a negative. And that's, that's why she told him. She thought that he would agree that that's, that's a good thing. Now we, you know, that we can keep it. Excuse me. And Lou shows up late at night and wants money. And Lou tells Hank that Jacob told him about Dwight Stevenson and threatens that he's going to tell the sheriff. And Hank convinces Lou that it's a day's drive to get the money 
very clever. Clearly, Lou can't handle the idea that they can easily get the money. You know, if, if he continues to keep believing that, he will keep pressuring Hank to give him the money now. And it's also it's this really tense moment where, like, you know, Hank doesn't even want Lou to come in. He doesn't want him to stay, you know. And he walks up, you know, behind and, and get the money. And Lou walks just really close and, like, leaning and sends to see if he can see. That's, you know, you, you're really... I mean, I guess Hank probably doesn't have the money there anyway, right? It's like maybe his his coat with his wallet in it. He ran, Yeah, because it was $40. And the, the bills were all hundreds. So, yeah. Which is also, I've seen some people say, well, why doesn't he try to spend the money there at the end? Well, if it's hundred, all of the bills are hundreds. Anywhere he goes, he's going to have to give someone a hundred dollar bill. And yeah, it's, you know, people are going to be like, where the, how do you have a hundred dollar bills? You know, that's not, that's not a normal thing. That's a lot of money to have, you know. And if they put him in the bank, same thing, you know, they're going to have to tell the bank, can you change my hundred dollar bills into smaller denominations? You know, it's possible the FBI has already contacted local banks and been like, if someone comes in with a lot of hundred dollar bills, call us, stall them, call us. You know, yeah. And the, let's see. yeah, you know, basically there's no way around that. You either have to spend hundred dollar bills or you have to change them into other currency. You know, I don't know, I guess hypothetically they, or yeah, or give them to, or, or put them in a bank vault or something like that. You know, the moment that they start spending the money, it's going to, yeah. And, and Hank tells, you know, talks to Jacob, it's like there's two sides and Jacob's like, why are you two always talking about sides? And then Hank goes, who's talking about sides? Hank hoped that he would get Jacob to, excuse me, to agree more, you know, to, to be on his side when he brought up sides. So when he realizes that Jacob doesn't like the, the idea of sides, he pretends that they weren't talking about sides. He's manipulating the situation, trying to control everything. I mean, it's essentially gaslighting. He's basically saying, what do you mean? I didn't say that. Where did you hear that? You know. And I'll talk about Sarah breastfeeding and talking about Lou confessing in the next section. Sarah and Hank are briefly spooked by the noise of someone going into the room right next to theirs. In reality, there's nothing actually wrong there, but because what they're doing is wrong, they're scared of getting caught. I mean, Comparatively, if they weren't doing anything wrong, the only way there could be something wrong like that is if instead of just hearing someone entering or leaving the room next door is if they heard crying from the next door or something, you know. But now things that are completely harmless seem threatening. And Sarah at first doesn't like that Hank brought Jacob, you know, brought to their house. So when she hears that he invited him for dinner, She's glad that it, it's working out in their favor, not that she's happy to sp be spending time with family. <clears throat> also, when when Jacob talked about, you know, well, you know, Hank was like, well, how, what, what do we say, the, where, where do we say the money came from? And Jacob's like, you can just say Sarah inherited. Nobody out here knows her family. And Hank can't argue against that. He comes up with a new argument. But that's actually, you know, Jacob is not stupid. You know, he's he's capable of thinking deeper about things and being more observant than people give him credit for. And it's also, I'm just briefly, into, you know, it's it's a when when you know Hank is like, I'm gonna I'm gonna go put, you know, yeah, he says move the the he doesn't say anything about the money. He says I'm gonna I'm gonna move the, the, uh, what's it called? I'm going to move the pilot, there it is. Uh, you know, so you, you keep watch. And if someone comes by, just say you're changing the tire. Well, that's not gonna work, why not? Well, they can tell that there's air in the tire. 
Good point. Well, you know, observant, you know. Observe this, and then he lets some of the, the air out. Oh, that's, that's cool. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very brother thing to do. You know, that's, yeah. And Jacob has been carrying the pain of knowing that their father committed suicide for years, missing their father. You know, he says, I was the one always talking to him. And Lou is drunk and really friendly with Hank. And Jacob clearly doesn't like it because he knows that they're screwing over Lou. I've always felt that the, the reason the guy in the bar trips Lou is because he feels like, you know, Lou shouldn't have grabbed the waitress. And Lou can't piece that together. You know, when, when the guy trips him, he's not like, okay, fine, I shouldn't have grabbed her. You know, but it's like, you know, he grabs the waitress. I, I forget, I, I'm not sure, I, I don't remember exactly what the waitress said. I think she says something like, hey, or something. But clear, you know, it's clear that she didn't like it, and he doesn't apologize. I think he kind of laughs it off, and so the the guy standing at the bar is like, "What a jerk!" And I'm gonna trip him, you know. And and Lou doesn't realize, or, or no, I I don't think I don't think it's that he doesn't care. I think he legitimately he he can't, you know, he he didn't realize that that was what was going on, you know, if like. I mean, I feel like if I was Lou and the guy just tried to trick me, I would try to have enough self-awareness to be like, fair enough. I grabbed her against her will. You tripped me against my will. We're even. Fine. But, you know, he almost gets in a fight. And it's that, you know, the, the like, for the whole scene, it's like, you know, Lou is very drunk. And he's, he, he's happy drunk. You know, he's... Like, it's, ah, you're my friend, and you're my friend, we're all friends. And then suddenly this other guy is like, you're, we're not, you know, then, then it gets to be a, a conflict. And right before Lou's wife comes down, Lou is still telling bad jokes. And now Jacob isn't laughing, but Hank is, because Jacob feels bad about, you know, that about what they're about to do. And Hank is pretending to like Lou so that he'll do what you know what Hank wants him to do the entire scene at Lou's house is easily my favorite scene of the entire movie the way it gradually changes intention and honestly yeah it it could have been directed by Hitchcock i i suppose i'm not sure that Hitchcock was maybe more about plot than character he wasn't the he wasn't the best actor's director you know so the the you know, there's that. He, there are a number of quotes. You know, th things Hitchcock is supposed to have said in response to to cast and crew and and such. One of the the things is an an actor was asking him, "Why am I walking?" You know. Yeah, why am, why am I walking down the, the hall or something like that? Because he, he wanted to know how to play the scene. And Hitchcock responded, because it's in the script. But what's my motivation? Your paycheck. And, yeah. I don't, I don't bring, bring out my, my Hitchcock impersonation all that often. It used to be pretty good. I feel like briefly yeah okay I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this brief and then I'm gonna get back to this movie I swear there's wow sorry that was Jimmy Stewart that was way off I'm supposed to have said that actors are like cattle that's that's a terrible dreadful thing to say. I would never say something like that what I may have said is that actors should be treated like cattle. Yeah. Okay, it it needs work. It's it's not as sharp as it used to be. Anyway. But but yeah, you know, it it's it's very Hitchcocky in this 
the way the the tension changes it's actually yeah that's something that you know i, I want to say lindsay ellis pointed out when talking about transformers she pointed out that the camera changes in in psycho when i can't believe i'm blanking on the name but i am blanking on the yeah when when marion crane when marion crane is talking to unreal uh okay anthony perkins you know for a while it's a it's a pleasant conversation but then the tension changes and the angles change to to really highlight and that's also actually yeah that's something i really appreciate about this it uses acting more than it uses angles to really hype up the tension you know, and it's it's the kind of thing you know in Hitchcock's day that would have been called bad filmmaking, but by 1998 people were ready for actors to give such nuanced performances. I mean, just watch the scene and look at their body language, just how how phony Hank is being, and Lou's too drunk to realize that Hank is being phony, and Jacob is just like he's he doesn't want to be there, like hypothetically if the scene was filmed again and the the and and where jacob was sitting was on fire i don't think he would have looked any more uncomfortable than he already does he just he, he wants this to be over he doesn't want to be here he doesn't want to be betraying his best friend and and all this stuff and and just yeah you know, at first, Jacob is unhappy about the situation because he feels like he's betraying Lou, which is basically true. And then Jacob and Lou start making fun of Hank, who realizes that Jacob and Lou make fun of him behind his back. And then we realize that Jacob is actually making Lou fake confess. And then the situation changes to Lou realizing that they tricked him. Then it changes him. You know, once he realizes that Jacob tricked him, that they were in on it together, and then the, they're pointing, even using, you know, pointing guns at each other, even using guns. And I, I will talk about them using guns in the next section. That was an insinuation. It's been months since that first scene, and Lou is still not over Hank using that word. Stay out here and talk to me. Tell, tell me what's going on. He's been forced to face so many painful things in his life that by now he has a very hard time intentionally facing them. You know, he knows. He knows what just happened. It's just he, you know, he, he kind of feels like if, if, he can, if he can keep it away just just a little bit, you know. And, and at the end of the day, I think there is a very real chance that Lou would have ended up shooting Hank. The the yeah. I I think Jacob saved Hank's life by shooting Lou, but that doesn't make it hurt any less. And once Lou is dead, Hank is immediately ready to try to convince Nancy to help keep the secret. And and she you know she says you really think I'm gonna let you keep the money, and once he kills her, which is obviously in self defense, he very quickly devises a way to make it seem as though Lou killed Nancy. Meanwhile, Jacob is basically frozen in fear, and it's several minutes from him shooting Lou to him entering the house, and then he walks into the basement, and Hank tells Jacob the story they're gonna t tell the cops. <clears throat> I love that as they're talking, suddenly Hank turns to face, you know, and then we hear, you ran outside with Jacob? And that's, you know, the cut makes it appear as though the sheriff is asking the question, you know, sorry, as the sheriff is asking the question, he's literally looking at them down in the basement since they already did call the cops, you know. And then Hank has to try to explain away the discrepancy between the stories. And, you know, Hank realizes he has to make it very convincing since there is, you know, the, there's a tape recorder recording what he's saying. So if he's like stuttering or 
contradicting himself, it's going to be extremely obvious, you know. So, like, honestly, I feel like if he started stammering and such, then it would, you know, it would cut back to the tape recorder, and then it would pan out, and we see that they're playing it in court or something, you know. After the funeral, we see Jacob drinking at the bar, deeply burdened by loneliness and guilt, entirely by himself. You know, survivor's guilt and, you know, yeah, feeling like he shouldn't have shot Lou. A lot of, you know, a lot of people didn't think very much of Lou, but to Jacob, he was one of the only sources of joy in his life. And that's, again, I, I do feel like the movie does have empathy for Lou and Jacob. And... I think that is right, for, for at least for this movie. I'm not saying every movie has to have empathy for all characters. And Sheriff Carl starts talking... Uh, to, yeah, it starts talking to Hank, and at first we're like really scared of what he's about to say, and then we're relieved that it's just Jacob, and it's also a great cut, because we've just seen Jacob in pain at the bar. But this whole thing, you know, he, he comes up and he's knocking, you know, Hank, I'm really sorry to have to do this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you to, to come. You know, th this whole thing, and we're like, oh, he knows, he knows about the money, and he's gonna, you know. But no, it's, I'm sorry, but I had to take in Jacob, and you know, this, this whole thing, just yeah. And very tense scene at the barbers when Carl, Carl comes in and talks about the FBI and a lost plane. And, and just, you know, at, at first, like, you know, Carl's like, hmm, he's getting a little bit of a, uh, uh, what's it called? You're getting, you're getting a little thin, the hairs, and, and Hank is like, don't you have crimes to solve? <laughs> and, and, like, I don't remember exactly what it, I think Carl says, you know, you and your brother, when you heard that plane, and, you know, Hank me like, turns to, to fake, because he's like, oh, crap, what was that? You know, and, and the barber, like, does this so he can keep this. It's just, yeah. Now, the way I figured it, the, you know, the, the kidnapper, supposed FBI guy, has been calling small towns, claiming he's FBI, asking if they know something about a missing plane. And the reason that it was maybe a while between the, you know, the, the plane crashing and then him now, there it is, yeah, the, the plane crashing and him actually, you know, coming by, let's see, I figure, hmm, I mean, I can I can understand why some say that it's kind of convenient writing that you know the movie's about the movie's ready to end so in comes this guy. Let's see. Okay, I I didn't really think of of. I think I thought of it months ago, but I didn't write it down at the time. So, but I I don't think that it's a plot hole. I feel like it's there there are explanations for why. It, it took so long. Now, let's see. Was he maybe hoping that if he waited for a couple of months, then the snow would have melted? Like, maybe at first he called places that didn't have snow, so where the plane would have been found much quicker. And, you know, then after a while he realized, well, it must have been covered by snow. I'll call once it's once the weather gets hotter so the snow will have melted and then either it got very suddenly colder or he lost patience or something but you know and, and as for well why, how did he even know well he I, I figured that I mean he knew where the plane took off from obviously because they had agreed on that and he knows when it was supposed to get there and where it was supposed to get to. And he knows that it didn't. So he started going over. I mean, that's the thing. It's possible that he 
you know, he's been calling like, I don't know, 50 different places, you know, or, or yeah, just a, a really high amount of different places because he didn't know how far the plane got or something. And Hank and Jacob are almost all the way out of Carl's office when the supposed FBI guy asks if he can take them, if they can take him out there. And it's just oh, so close, so close to safety. And Sarah realizes the FBI guy is one of the kidnappers and calls, you know, and, and, and just like, and, and at first Carl's like, ah, oh, hi, yeah. yeah, Hank is here. He's trying to get, he's trying to get out of having to eat one of my wife's deep fried donuts. How's the baby, you know, and, and she's like, ah, oh, that's actually, she's actually not doing so well. And and then he's like, oh well, I guess you better, uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll let you talk to Hank and you know and she's like, it's him, you know there, it's it's definitely him and and meanwhile Hank, you know it's not like he can just stand there and say, the FBI guy is really a kidnapper, you know he has to be like, yeah, oh, Sarah, and it's just. This, this whole, and, and when he goes, Sarah, that, like, they like look at him and it's like, what, what's going on? You know, he's, he's just, it's such an excellent, and yeah, Hank, let's see, yeah, so, sorry, yeah, back to the, let's see, Sarah tells Hank they have to pretend so they don't trust the, trust, blah, trust the possible kidnapper, and the, oh, right, sorry, yeah, I'm just, these are notes from before the before she makes the call, but it's just she's realized that the FBI guy might be one of the kidnappers in real. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Sarah tells Hank they have to pretend, you know, don't trust the possible kidnapper, and and he's like, well, what if I call and say the baby is sick? So the baby, which the camera made sure subtly is in frame, you know, Sarah's now using it to to give Hank an excuse to go home without risking the kidnapper killing. The baby is now a tool. You know, the the before the they knew about the money, the baby was their their future and it's amazing as such. But then you know that they once the money is there, you know, now now the baby is a, a tool to make sure they you know, well okay, it's I don't know if it's necessarily about keeping the money. It's it, it's it's definitely at least in part about not dying at the hands of the kidnapper, but still it's it's yeah. And Hank asks Carl about seeing the FBI badge, and Carl doesn't think it's a big deal that he didn't see the the badge. And Sarah calls Hank and says, you know, that is the kidnapper and. You know, he should go home. I really appreciate that during... What does that say? Yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 um, the subtle acting during the, the, you know, Hank can't give away what he's hearing since the, let's see. Oh, no, never mind. This is what I was yeah yeah. I appreciate the subtle acting on the kidnapper's face. You know, the <clears throat> once we know that Gary Cole that's it. Gary Cole is what that's supposed to say. Anyway, Gary Cole Cole, once we know he's one of the kidnappers, he's like, Where's your brother? And is that well, you know the the He's he's been drinking pretty hard. Well, we'll just have to find it the three of us. And you know you can tell it's like that was not. I was really hoping that you know he's he's upset, but he's careful not to show it. And uh, yeah, because it's like it's going to be more difficult for him now to get rid of Jacob, the final witness. But that doesn't mean that he can't do it. It's not you know completely. Hopeless. It's just very good. Anyway. Now. 
I'll talk about Hank trying to... Why is this there? Trying to arm himself in the next section. It's such a great detail that Hank doesn't already know exactly which bullets... That literally killing me, but there we go. Yeah, he doesn't know exactly which bullets will fit the revolver. He's not used to revolvers. It's not like in video games where the player character knows that kind of thing. I'm not criticizing video games. I'm just using that as an example. And let's see. Yeah, and Hank tried to convince them to drive at the wrong place, but Carl remembers where they were. You know, like he's supposed to. He's a good cop. And the four of them split up. I guess a horror movie or something. And Hank goes to where he knows the plane is and then realizes that the beer can Lou brought, and which he shared with Jacob, and I think it was also offered to, to Hank. They actually dropped it near the plane. Wow. And let's see. Yeah, and Hank tries to convince Carl the kidnapper uh, is not a fed. I know some people question why the kidnapper tells Hank to go into the plane. I figured that he thinks if Hank had a gun, he would have already shot, uh, you know, shot at the, the Fed. And let's see, maybe he does believe that they didn't realize there was money in the plane, so it's still in there. I also talked to someone who questions why would the kidnapper shoot at the plane. Well, he does want Hank dead in the long run. And, you know, hypothetically, if he had killed Hank with the couple of bullets that he shot through the plane, he would have just gone and grabbed the money himself. The reason he doesn't just go into the plane and leave Hank out there is that Hank might run and talk to someone. And Jacob gets there and Hank explains the story that we'll cover. And Jacob's clearly just done. That's no, no more. He can't. And Jacob threatens committing suicide if Hank doesn't kill him. And so Hank does eventually agree and, and shoot him. There's a bitter irony that when the actual FBI approach, they do in fact immediately show Hank their badge. It's almost like God or the universe, whichever you want, is making fun of him. That's what you wanted, right? To see a real FBI badge? Well, here you go. And... Right before Hank throws the money into the fireplace, Sarah insists they could leave the country. Hypothetically, they could, but they'd be looking over their shoulder the rest of their lives. If they go to a country that extradites to the U.S., then it's just a matter of time before that happens. If they go to a country that hasn't yet got an extradition treaty, well, who's to say that they won't ever get one? You know, Hank and Sarah may spend the rest of their lives the rest of their lives in a country not, sorry, even, yeah, even if, even if Hank and Sarah do manage to spend the rest of their lives living in a country not getting extradited, they will literally be afraid of every single day of that happening. And, you know, it's not like it's just their life. They have a daughter. Is, is their daughter going to be a refugee or living in, you know, I'm not saying there's something wrong with leaving your country, but leaving it because you have to, and because you're a criminal in your own country, it's not really... If you can avoid that, that's probably a good idea, too. The movie has a great book ending. It opens on Hank and Sarah doing everyday stuff with Hank narrating about if he and Sarah are happy or not. At the start of the movie, they do appear to basically be happy. They don't really think about the fact that they are, aren't rich. But then, at the end, they think about all the murders, the money they could have had, but lost. Now, let's see. So... 
Yeah, so the movie is an hour, two and a half minutes long without any credits, and 56 minutes with them. I think I'm going to have to rush through some of this video with how sore my back is right now. Let's see, so, oh wow, perfect. Notes taken, oh, notes taken before watching, there we go. So yeah, really, really psyched to see how Doctor Strange 2 comes out. I was definitely sad to see the original director leave the pro project over creative differences, but I have been hoping to see Sam Raimi direct another horror movie comic book adaptation since the the very first time I watched the, the original Dark Man, which must have been sometime in the late 90s. I honestly feared that his career was dead when Oz the Great and Powerful didn't do well. I haven't watched it, so I have no idea if it's as bad as many say, but he's proven that he's incredibly talented, so I'm really happy to see him do this. I don't personally blame him that much for Spider-Man 3. They kept pushing him to include more, and he did his best. Excuse me. Right, so yeah, I already mentioned, uh, you know, cinematographer Ala Kivilo. The, the, you know, in addition to this movie, what I've watched by him are The Glass House, Hearts War, Aurora Borealis. At this time of year, at this time of day, in this part of the country, localized entirely within your kitchen. May I see it? Come on, give me a break. I couldn't I couldn't possibly not do that. I don't know how anyone actually managed to name a movie Aurora Borealis. I, I can't hear those two words without thinking of that quote. So anyway. I love how at first Sarah is completely ethical about the money when it's theoretical, but the moment that it's real, we get that what does that say? We, yeah, we get that well-acted change from happiness to realizing they're going to have to be very harsh and cynical if they want to keep the money. And, and actually, I had forgotten, she doesn't immediately say we should, they should keep the money. It's still, it's still a, an argument, but by the, you know, after they've eaten dinner and done the dishes, once they're going to bed, then she starts to be like, you know, th then she's agreed to, to keep it. And, yeah, the rest of the movie she's shown to be very capable, remarkably cold and calculating calculations. She's the one who comes up with the idea of getting Lou on tape confessing. There's even this moment that always makes me think of Macbeth, where as she is breastfeeding, she's expressing this calculation. It always makes me think of the line from Macbeth, of Lady Macbeth saying she must fill her breasts with snake venom instead of mother's milk. I really appreciate that even though the movie eventually racks up a body count, it has a very credible, gradual increase in tension towards that. It doesn't feel ham-fisted and awkward. And this is also where... Th sorry, this is also the movie I think about when I think about pro-gun control movies where it feels very credible and realistic. I am staunchly pro-gun control, and that's why I find it so frustrating when movies try to make the case in favor of gun control and end up coming across as though they're really pushing that agenda. It doesn't feel like it comes organically. It doesn't feel like it belongs in the movie. It feels like the movie has temporarily been taken over by an after-school special, and even I cringe and hope that the movie will soon return to result We'll soon return to normal. There we go. Among other things in this, the pro-gun control argument comes from a growing anxiety in a gro group of people who know each other well, which is something that happens when guns are around. Clearly, the reason these people have guns is that they think they will need them for self-defense, and they actually end up shooting the wrong person. 
You can understand why Lou was anxious. He genuinely thought that Bill Paxton was going to turn him in. I maintain, not everybody, I've talked to some people who don't agree with me on this, but I maintain he did not understand the distinction that it was for insurance. He didn't, for, for him it wasn't so abstract. Same as, like, when he was threatening about it, it wasn't in the abstract. He wasn't talking about, you know, I, hypothetically, I could turn you in. He's saying, I will turn you in if you don't give me the money. So when they have it on tape, you know, yeah. And then Lou's wife believes that Bill Paxton, sorry, Hank is threatening her with the gun and so believes that she is shooting in self-defense, which is also something that happens very often with guns. It doesn't make the fe people feel more safe. It convinces the people that they need to use the gun. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The movie does a really good sh job showing that when it comes to guns, the idea of good guy with a gun versus bad guy with a gun is much less common than people who know each other accidentally ending up shooting each other. Obviously, in real life, it's not actually over huge sums of money, but it is when tensions flare, when someone feels threatened. And, you know, obviously, at the end of the movie, you know, Hank does manage to shoot the, the kidnapper. I really love the opening of this. Well, I really love all of it, but I, I want to talk about the opening of it just briefly. We see a fox trying to get into a hen house, and you know later on, we see that it we we see that it does. But at the very start, we just see that it's it's running around trying to find you know a, yeah, and yeah, it does ultimately accomplish this, and then it runs off with. A dead chicken in its mouth and Jacob Frank and Lou Hank and Lou sorry spot the fox and follow it and you know the 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 fact that it's they, they see it as something that's threatening in some way yeah you know when when Dwight Stevenson shows up it's actually because he was trying to get that fox so that it wouldn't kill more chickens and as the two brothers and Lou follow, you know, yeah, and at first it's also the dog chasing the fox. They end up further into the woods than usual, which is why nobody else has found the plane. It's been covered with snow. It's further up than usual. If you happen to live or have visited very cold places, you know that people don't normally go further out than they feel comfortable with because it's freezing. It might be slippery. It might be dangerous. But the fox helps them find the money. Metaphorically speaking, they are foxes, the plane full of money is the hen house. And that's why they're almost caught by Dwight Stevenson, who doesn't want a fox around because of how eagerly it will go for the chickens. Because they refuse to hand him the money. It's a metaphor that extremely easily could have been hand-fisted, but I would say it really works. And, you know, others have pointed to the, the, the crows or ravens, they're, they're blackbirds, and they're not the kind that the X-Men fly around in. Although that would be an interesting, I suppose if the X-Men shrunk, they could use a raven. Yeah, I don't know. I'm in a, I'm in a goofy mood today. Early on, you get the sense that Jacob is just kind of simple, a little slow. But later on, you realize how much pain he's been carrying because of his and Hank's father sacrificing so much to help Hank, and we know that Hank didn't even get a particularly high-paying job from his college education. Sarah points out how little upward mobility his job has. He has to wait for his superior to, to retire or die so he can take over that guy's job. Another thing that causes Jacob a lot of pain is that one girl who seemed interested in him turned out to just be with him for money, and he's kept that secret for decades. I'll talk more about that later in this, in the, actually, I'll talk about that in the third section. Final section, there we go. Got there eventually. I get why some people might say that the writing is contrived, because basically every single time they try to do a smart thing, something bad happens. And I do think there's an argument to be made that it is kind of misogynist and how cold Sarah turns out to be. For example, telling Hank to go home and abandon the sheriff with the phony FBI guy, and even 
you know, when Hank refuses to abandon the sheriff, she calls Jacob and makes sure he goes risking his life to save her husband. She convinces Hank to go back to the plane. To be fair, he she wanted him to go alone. He was the one who brought Jacob. Let's see, but yeah, that's when Jacob tries to kill Dwight so he doesn't find the plane. But he doesn't quite manage to kill him, so he has to finish him off. Sarah convinces Hank to trick Lou into confessing on tape so that he doesn't have power over Hank. That leads to the death of both Lou and Nancy. I would really love to be able to call it empowering, you know, a woman self-actualizing, taking her destiny into her own hands. But the movie is insistent on her ideas making things worse, so it's hard not to realize, read it as a conservative, pleasing message of women shouldn't run things because when they do, things go wrong. I still love the movie, but it's, I don't know, I have a hard time completely going away from, yeah. Maybe the movie should have had it be more halfway, like half of the ideas are hers and the other half ideas are his. Okay, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it almost does feel like, you know, she's a, a temptress luring a good man into evil deeds. The very ending reveals that there was never any way they could have gotten away with spending any of the money. Let's see. Yeah, the, the money they found. Now, to some people, that might make the movie feel meaningless. But I feel it really hammers home the part, the, the point, and it is very Hitchcockian, crime does not pay. All the people that they've ended up killing was for nothing. The movie does a good job of making it easier to understand both why Lou finds excuse me, Hank to be condescending, excuse me, and why Hank does behave the way he does, since he doesn't actually want to upset Lou. That's always been my read, at least. So this is their exchange very early on about how Hank used the word insinuate. To Hank, using words like that is just second nature, but Lou doesn't hear those kinds of word, words that often in his day-to-day -day life, so he feels like Hank is trying to upset him. Now, given that the movie is about greed, I've, I, I pondered if, you know, does it have to justify why these characters are poor? Since if the plane had been found by rich people, they might have just turned it in because it would have been pocket change to them. I mean, several of the biggest names connected to this movie have more than enough money, so it's easy for them to say that greed is evil. You know, like, I, I can imagine that someone like... I mean, considering... Billy Bob Paxton... Billy Bob... Oh, wow. I swear I've gotten enough sleep. I don't know what, why I'm so... Anyway, Billy Bob Thornton, I would guess, at least... I, I don't even know if he is still in movies. Anyway, back then, I would imagine he was well-paid, since, you know, he was, like, award-winning and a really big deal. So I could imagine that he, in real life, could... And anyway... Yeah, it's easy to say that greed is evil if you have more than enough money. I mean, ultimately, the movie, none of them, it's not really their own fault. They were basically born into the situation. You know, the, the clearly Jacob is willing to, you know, it's basically he can't really find a job. So he, you know... Actually, yeah, doesn't Sarah say that it's he's unemployed because they don't have any steady work for him. So sometimes he does the odd, you know, odd jobs. I mean, ultimately, I don't think the movie is saying that if you're poor, you're evil. And that is obviously a very important thing to avoid. And yeah. And Jacob points out that Hank only takes tiny sips of whiskey. I have to wonder if it's because Hank is afraid of losing self control and thus control over the money situation. Let's see. 
I, I love the the tension of the last chunk of the movie. You know, Sarah calls and informs Hank, you know, our worst nightmare is the truth. The supposed FBI agent is indeed the brother from the same mother of the airplane pilot. Hank manages to steal a gun from the, the sheriff without being noticed and some bullets, but then it cuts and we don't know. I, I think it fades and then, you know, we go to, we don't know if he was able to put in any bullets. And, uh, yeah, and, and in the car we see him, like, he's like, let's say if this is like the, the his pants, he's got like the gun here. He's, some of the time he's like covering it with the jacket and then some of the time he's like readying it. And if, you know, and we see this POV shot where he's looking and, you know, the back of, yeah, so the back of FBI guy's head, back of Carl's head, and then the back, holy crap, the FBI guy's staring right at him, you know. And then it cuts back and we see that his hands are like on his legs or something. He's no longer got the gun in his hand. It's just, it's so effective. And it's again, like, I mean, okay, people are going to look at you. You're going to freak out every single time someone's going to look at you. But if they have a gun, and you have a gun, and they want to kill you, and you may or may not be ready to shoot them in self-defense, yeah, then you freak out. And, let's see. Yeah, and finally he manages to put, I think he only does manage to put one bullet in the gun, and that's, like, in the plane. Like, he, you know, <laughs> where's the money? In the plane. Then go get it, and, ah, uh, okay. He can, you know, and, and he's got to watch out because the plane still, the you know, based on where you're standing, and, you know, the plane isn't meant to be crashed the way it is, you know, so because of that, it doesn't, is it maybe some of the leg, some of the legs break? I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but, yeah, every time he goes in, near the plane, you know, it goes, uh, just, and it's it's such a and at first it's just like a jump scare, but then near the end of the movie it's like oh crap this is you know we're so scared that he's not going to be able to get at least one bullet in the gun so that he can shoot the kidnapper. But but yeah the the, the whole thing <clears throat> with the with the bullets and the yeah. So the 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 other kidnapper gets in touch with Hank and it's like. Hello, Hank. What's happening? Um, I'm gonna need you to go ahead and come in tomorrow. So, you could be here around nine. That would be great. Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. I'm, I'm also gonna need you to go ahead and die tomorrow too. Okay. I uh, lost my brother when the plane crashed, and uh, I sort of gotta get rid of loose ends. I, I, I don't know if anybody can look at Gary Cole and not hear that. So, I've seen some say that they just don't buy that Hank would help kill Dwight Stevenson. And in general, they... Uh, oh, never mind. I actually, that was what I already talked about. I meant to move it from there into the review, and then I guess I just talked about the review stuff. I, I added it to the review, but I forgot removing that. Now, let's see. So, on YouTube, I found a couple of interviews. Uh, Billy Bob Thornton. Four minutes. Yeah, four minute interview. And he says, Jacob has never grown up. And he said, you know, there's a lot of humor in Hitchcock movies, and this gets that. And. Huh. I'm not 100% sure if I wrote in response to that. I think Hitchcock would love this movie, or if that was what Billy Bob Thornton actually said. And yeah, there was also one with Bill Paxton. I don't really have anything to say to it. Rediscovering a Simple Plan was also a good video. And there was only one trailer, and it's very effective. It sets it up well. It does get close to spoiling too much. I guess it just barely doesn't quite spoil, but yeah. But yeah, the the both the yeah my DVD also came with the the trailer. It's the same one on online as on DVD. And that brings us to the final section. 
Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. So I've noted a bunch of things. I'm going to skim through them and go into the most, let's see, Remy rejects hyped up camera tricks and jokey shock effects and creates living complex characters whose fates we care about. The result is easily his finest film to date. Oh wow, and that was actually, that was written in 2012, so I guess that person thinks this is even better than like Spider-Man 2. I mean, I think that, but I didn't, yeah, anyway. I've seen some people say that they guessed what the ending would be, and I can see what they mean. You know, the the we are you know, we're told relatively early on there were two kidnappers. You know, yeah, it's it's not a huge reach to. You know, yeah, I can understand how. I've never felt like the movie was boring while we're waiting to get to the, and that is, it's, it sucks when that happens. There are movies, I've seen movies where, you know, you, you guess where it's going and it's just like, okay, can we please get there because, yeah. Now, let's. Money can't buy you happiness. It hasn't been this vividly re-examined in decades, and we're the richer for it. Cute. An unleashed Rainy may be a more exciting movie maker, but there's something to be said for the virtues of a good story well told, which describes a simple plan down to its last shivery snowflake. That was written before Snowflake became a slur. Well, slur. A f ah. Insult is what I'm, yeah. Don't worry, I'm not one of the people who thinks that it's literally a slur. That's, yeah. Now, let's see. I am skimming through a lot of these because my back. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so there's some stuff on IMDb I want to get into. And yeah, so the three taglines are Sometimes good people do evil things. Four million dollars and plenty of change. They've worked hard all their lives, but they still can't afford the American dream. Stealing it is even better. Which is basically like a slight rewrite of the some of the dialogue, which I, I love. And... It's actually kind of funny The, yeah, I'm just going to read. During a 2002 interview on the national public, public radio program pressure, Bill Paxton told interviewer Terry Gross that he didn't know that his own father had been cast in the movie in the small role of Mr. Schmidt until he arrived at a production office at the start of filming and saw his father's headshot on the wall among the other cast members. It turned out that John Paxton had written a letter to director Sam Raimi saying, I've always admired your films, and I was wondering if there were any small parts that I'd possibly be right for. And Raymond gave him an audition. And he must have really liked him, because, uh, once again, he's in 
at least two, possibly all three of the Spider-Man movies. So, yeah, and he's he's good in that. He's in in that role. Is what I'm saying. Scott P. Smith originally conceived his story as a screenplay, but decided to turn it into a novel first, before writing a screenplay based on that. It was actually, they, they bought the rights, like, lickety-split, like, immediately. I, th I, think the mov the, I think the book wasn't even entirely done before the, the movie rights were, were sold. And it's like, you want to you wanna turn your novel, which was almost already a screenplay, into a screenplay? He did a really good job. I've, I've seen a lot of, like, you would think that some that that the author themselves would be perfect for adapting their own book but a lot of novel novelists have a hard time going over to screenplays and apparently he did have some at, at first he wrote a way too long screenplay but he did an incredible job trimming it down i guess maybe that's one of the things that's why some people feel that it's long they they can tell that it was trimmed, and they feel it should have been trimmed further. Now, let's see. And... Right, and these are some of the IMDb groups. When the money is burned in the fireplace, you can see that some of the bills say motion picture use only. And it's like, what are they going to do? Burn real money? You know, it's it sucks. And of course, it says, you know, it. I think it's legally required to put motion picture use only on. You have to write something like that on fake money. Otherwise, it's considered counterfeit money. And vacant farmhouse has little snow on roof. Yeah, uh, you know, I I figured they probably removed some of the snow because they didn't want it to be like a risk. Like, you know, if, if the roof is very weighed down, maybe it might break and the actors might be in trouble. You know, that was by and by in trouble. I do, of course, mean they might literally get physically hurt. When, you know, I can, I can maybe kind of see how, I'm, I'm not sure I did read someone else saying this, but if maybe it's a little too close to a one-liner when, you know, when the, when the Fed says, looks like we're both going to have an awful lot of explaining to, and Hank responds, just me, and shoots, you know, that's maybe a little bit too much, yeah. I mean, it's still the, the dry wit, but it's maybe a little too... Yeah, and I really, the, the writing of the narration there at the end, you know, there are days when I manage not to be, and then, you know, he talks about all the things he, you know, all the thinking about it, and, the, and then it ends with, those days are few and far between, you know, their life is worse off for not having turned in that money. And the the bit with yeah I'm I'm just really quickly gonna you know the, the the yeah so this is from the memorable quote section the the entire quote ends with did you notice anything like that in the guy you shot today you know leading up to that for for a lot of it you don't know exactly why it's being said we the all we, the audience, and Hank worry that Hank is going to accidentally make one of the mistakes they mention, you know, because it's stuff that there is that's that's very obvious, you know, that they say, like, shifting eyes, wooden or stilted tone, which is something that Bill Paxton was accused of in his acting gestures that either that seem either slightly robotic or else unnecessarily expansive details tend to be vague slippery 
you know, so all these things were like, don't do it, Hank, don't, don't do any of those things, and just, yeah. And, and it's very clever, the, you know, the money isn't marked, but there's no way, you know, it's one out of ten of the bills, and Hank and Sarah have no way of finding out which of them, you know, if they could get that, if they could get the numbers, then they could throw, you know, then they could burn just those, but the, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, when when Lou is getting angry at the, the bar patron, you know, and, and the guy says, look, buddy, oh, don't buddy me, what the, see, this right here is my buddy, this guy right here is my buddy, you're not my fucking buddy, huh, you got it, you're not my buddy, friend. And and when when Jacob talks about the the you know that girl he dated for a month, you know, and he explains about the, the yeah that whole bit just really tears your heart out and stomps on it. I've long believed that a lot of times what people see as someone being less intelligent or more superficial is actually the person they think that about appearing that way because a lot of energy that could go into their intellect or make them seem less superficial is instead being used to push down pain, anxiety, depression so that people won't treat them as badly as when other people realize the pain, anxiety, and depression is there. And yeah, this conversation between the two characters points to that Jacob is a lot smarter than he first appears, but he has to constantly push away pain and anxiety and depression. And there's that bit where, you know, they, they talk about what to spend the money on, and he's like, I could buy a new truck. And Lou is like, get a, get a Trans Am. And he's like, oh yeah, my wildest fucking dream, a Trans Am. He doesn't, like, he, he can't completely accept that, yeah, of course you could afford a Trans Am. You have you know, there's millions in front of you. And yeah, and when when Hank and Jacob are talking about you know covering themselves from Lou turning them both in, and Hank is like, I can't afford to go to prison, Jacob. I mean, what about Sarah? What are they gonna do? And, and Jacob, like, pauses looking over to his old Christmas tree. I'm going to have to get rid of that Christmas tree. I'm going to have to get, yeah, I mean, it, it's too dry. It's going to start a fire. You get the sense that when Jacob gets in a tense situation, he tries to distract himself from it. He just can't maneuver the situation in a way that isn't going to hurt. And Sarah's monologue about, you know, how they're going to be stuck in the situation they're in if they can't keep the money. And, yeah, and in the, in the connections section on IMDb, the, this movie appears in two Watch Mojo top tens. It's number one on the top ten underrated film of the 1990s, Mighty High Placement, and it's number two on the top ten underrated films of all time. That is very, very high placement. So, yeah. Meanwhile, in the second video, they say the same thing about the movie. You know, that they say the same thing. And they use the same clips, so yeah, you know, it's it's 
they got to keep pushing out a lot of content so that they get enough clicks. For the adaptation, certain visual changes were made from the 335-page novel. Smith explained that one change involved the discovery of the crashed plane. His script had Lou Chambers throwing snowballs on cover of the plane. In the book, they're just walking and they find it. And that is definitely, it's, it's much more visual like that. You know, he's basically, he thinks that he's throwing it into nothing, but because it hits the wing of the plane, you know, hard than all the, the, what's it called? Superficial snow. I'm not Greenlandic. I don't have three different words for snow. That sounds disrespectful. Greenlandic people are awesome. The, the, the yeah, you know, the, uh, shallow snow, I guess, is what the, yeah. So the, the shallow snow on top of the, you know, comes off. And, you know, of course they're going to look at the plane then. And let's see. So, yeah, and and Smith explained, I had to make, I had to work to make Hank a more rational character, less evil. The shortening of the script also resulted in the character of Sarah having a smaller role, Jacob's involvement being much more larger in the book. And Smith described the film adaptation as being less violent than the book, explaining that it was Raimi's decision to be more restrained and bring out the characters. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and when they filmed inside the, the plane that, you know, when... when yeah, some some of the shots of the plane where you know they actually were on a gimbal. So yeah. And yeah, under the the section cinematography on Wikipedia, Sam Raimi said, "This is a change of pace for me because the film is not about shots, but the performance within the frame. I wanted the camera work to be invisible." and just allow the actors to tell this very thrilling story. And I would say that he, you know, I mean, I've already said that he did an incredible job here, but I would say that it also, it worked out well for his career onwards because there are quiet scenes in the Spider-Man movies where it's very much about performance. And yeah, on this, he got, you know, what's the phrase? He cut his teeth on it and he got, you know, he, he was, by, by the Spider-Man movies, it probably came more naturally to him to get a good performance. You know, several of the, the stars of those movies give legitimately strong, you know, I'm not a huge fan of the characterization of Mary Jane in those movies, but sometimes Kirsten Dunst, I, I don't think it's Kirsten Dunst's performance that's at fault. It's the writing. And, yeah, she gives, you know, there's that line in one of them where she says, everybody needs needs help from other people, even Spider-Man, you know, so, something like that. And, yeah, it's, it's convincing. <sighs> Holy crap, there's still a lot left. Okay. So, that brings... Right, so the... the Yeah. I am... I have reached the section for IMDb user reviews. I copied in the 100 most useful. There are 444 total. Or were when I started copying in.
Now, let's see. Things take increasingly violent turns until a simple plan has the air of a Shakespearean tragedy solidly biased by Hitchcockian twists. Add to this Raimi's weird sense of humor and a Coen Brothers Fargo-like frozen air, you have a superb film that will have you laughing uncomfortably as you ponder the extent to which men and women will go nuts and nasty when greed overcomes them. Yeah, here's a reviewer who says, I have read the novel and some things were changed. However, the changes were necessary as some parts of the novel weren't cinematic. What makes this movie work is that it forces us to ask ourselves questions about our morality. Not everyone will like the ending. I think it is perfect, and I agree. Now, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of negative reviews of the movie. I think the the critics liked it, but, um, you know, and some audiences did as well, but a number didn't. And that, okay, so that's it for those, and I have, okay, 72, and these are all for reviews I found via the, let's see, IMDb's external reviews section, and I tried to copy in, yeah, so yeah, there were 119 total. And I managed to copy in 59, so the rest of them are dead links, languages I don't speak, that kind of thing. Now, let's see. Yeah, so this is the... Uh, what's it called? It, uh, editing room abridged script by Rod himself, Rod Hilton. Uh, he he wrote it and put it up back when the movie was recent, like he also did with, for example, uh, Godzilla. But yeah, so one of the quotes from the script is director Sam Raimi. See, the point is that. While we, while we think we may act morally in this situation, if it arises, we may actually act differently. For the next hour, I will be beating this point into your skull, and you better fucking learn from it, even though you already knew. And... I...
yeah, I'm I'm just gonna briefly read some some of this. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, so I'm just gonna I'm the the funniest parts of the. Yeah, once, yeah, so, so you know, the scene where Bill Paxton says, what would you do if you found a lot of money? Who would you find? I would turn it in. I found a lot of money. Interesting. Okay, you need to go put some of it back in the plane in order to make sure that whoever searches for it doesn't suspect anything. Next, you need to get a little recorder and get your brother's friend on it, confessing to the next ten murders that will happen in the next few hours. And let's see. Yeah, he combines some of the scenes, but it works. That it, yeah. Suddenly, there is a knock on the door. Bill opens it. It's Brent and Billy. I want my money. Me too. No. Brent Briscoe pulling out his rifle. Give me it. Bill Paxton slightly less emotional. Yeah, every line he says is emotionless, but yeah, slightly less emotional. Yikes! A rifle. Don't you see? This money is tearing us apart. Director Sam Raimi, this money is tearing them apart, Bridget Fonda, pressing record on her handheld recorder. This money is tearing you apart. And he had paused. Hey, Brent, remember that time you killed people? Ha ha. Brent Risco, ha ha, yeah, that was funny. A good one. Are you? You're a laugh a minute, Bridget. Br Bridget Fonda, pulling out a recorder for no reason. Ha ha. You bitch. He he loads them their gun. That's an, those are the words written. I can't read that not reading that accent. Obviously, the suspenseful yeah in all caps the suspenseful dramatic music gets louder. Billy Bob shoots Brent in the head. Well, my tape recorder idea ended in death, but I have another idea. We need to drag his body over a long distance. They begin to drag the body. The local sheriff stops them. Sheriff, what the? Bridget takes her, out her rifle and shoots the sheriff in the head. Well, that didn't work either. I have another plan, though. We'll need string, dynamite, and four more dead bodies. Billy Bob Thornton shoots Bridget in the head. Bill Paxton, thanks. Billy Bob Thornton, money isn't the answer. I've learned that now. Money only hurts people. I wish I never found that money. I wish someone would kill me. Bill Paxton, all right. Bill shoots him in the head. Bill Paxton, money tears you. Two audience, money tears you apart. You should never start distrusting your thick friends because of money. It doesn't bring true happiness. Bill shoots himself in the head. Audience, wow, I've learned a lot. The audience members shoot themselves in their heads. I mean, that's obviously exaggeration, but I could understand how, you know, basically, yeah, he's saying the, the you know, there's way too much. It, it gets ridiculous in the movie with how many sh people shoot each other. And here somebody has actually also brought up Lady Macbeth. Let's see. Yeah. Now, let's see. I am skimming for a thing to read a comment on. Hmm. Yeah, we're getting there. Okay, almost done. Wow, I made a lot of notes. Okay. Almost there. Yeah, so that was all of them. I think I have said everything I wanted to, but yeah, it really, like the, I, I love this movie for 
all the reasons I mentioned. So I'm just very briefly going to show you the cover. I don't know why a decision was made, but someone wanted for the names and the faces on the cover to not line up. I, I, I can't explain it, but someone... I mean, it's kind of obvious, even if you don't know the the actors, I mean, Bill Paxton doesn't look like he's actually named Bridget Fonda. I don't mean that as like a, a trans transphobic thing. I just mean, doesn't look like he would, they would identify as a Bridget. And same thing for Bridget Fonda with the name Billy Bob Thornton under... And no, I don't think Billy Bob Thornton could pass for a Bill Paxton either, so I I really have no clue why. Maybe it was like an intern who got stuck with the job of finishing up the the art, and he was like, I'm not being paid for this anyway, so he decided to change around the names, and then by the time they printed all these, they, you know, no one realized, and then it was just, it would have cost them a lot of money to change it, I don't know. But, yeah, it's, I, I really, I would love to see Sam Raimi direct something similar to, not, not a sequel, obviously, but a spiritual successor or something similar to how, you know, Drag Me to Hell is not a sequel to Evil Dead, it's a spiritual successor. But, but yeah, I haven't watched all his movies, it's not impossible, I just, I don't think he's done, if, if there is one, it would be The Gift which I don't currently own a copy of. I remember liking it. I, I, like some of the acting in that movie is incredible. So, yeah. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time.